So, as requested for a while, and it's been on my to-do list for a while, is to get a, um, like an ASM 101 with bucket out to YouTube. Um, so introduction is just going to be like, we're going <coughs> to, <coughs> we're going to start from, <coughs> oh God, <coughs> ground zero. <laughs> we're going to start with nothing. We're going to be downloading the tool set, setting up a workspace and going through, uh, basically like my whole process of ASM and how I do my work here. <laughs> Two caveats right away that I want to mention. One, I'm still getting over COVID. I apologize for the coughing. <laughs> the fucking cough will not go away. Ugh. Two, um, what we're going to be going over is like how I do things. I don't claim that any of this is like the best way to do stuff. Uh, so if you're one of those guys who is like, oh my goodness, he's doing an extra compare when he could be doing an and, and it could be like four cycles faster. I, 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 I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I just want to make some cool, fun stuff and have a good time with the community. So, and number two, GitHub. Yeah, well, number three, GitHub. We're going to be going over GitHub very, very soon. <laughs> GitHub is crucial. All right. I'm actually going to be learning GitHub too. That's right, Lee. That's right. Okay. I'm going to be winging this. <laughs> I have like a general idea of what I want to go through in my head. But we're going to be kind of winging this. There's going to be a lot of mistakes. Things are going to break. I'll probably show you guys what a push and forget to pull off from the stack error looks like. It basically blows up the emulator, and that's hilarious. <laughs> so, introduction over, I think. Let's begin. I hope y'all are having a great day. Hope you're all having a great Saturday in whatever time zone you are. First of all, GitHub. Get a GitHub account. It's free. You can get as many as you want. And you can have both public and private repositories, all of them, for free. It's awesome. And it's like a free backup of all of your crap. So this is what we're going to be doing first. And I'll explain to you in just a second as to what it is and why we're doing it. So I'm just going to create a public GitHub repository. And this is just, it's going to be a location that houses all of our code and our ROM. So it's going to have like our entire hack project all in like one little location. Uh, what are we going to call it? Uh, ASM 101 with bucket. How about that? Cool. I'm going to ignore all this other stuff. And that's that. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and create a new project because I put all my projects in she colon backslash projects. By the way, anyone in chat... Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to shout them out. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to answer things as we go along here. <laughs> 99 little bugs in the code. 99, take one down, patch it around. 472 little bugs in the code. Yep. Johnny, that is how it works. All right, so here we go. I'm going to say MKDIR, which is like make a new directory. Or you can... I'll show you one thing in a heartbeat. Um, MKDIR uh, ASM 101. That's what I'm going to call it. CD ASM 101 Explorer dot. And that opens up your Explorer in that particular folder. So now we have absolutely nothing. Cool. Right now what we're going to do is we're going to download our tool sets. So we need our tool sets. We're going to go into Tools on SMW Central. We're going to look for three things right now. We're going to be using three things today. Yeah, yeah, I think three things. That'll be fine. So first is, we're actually not, not going to touch a SAR today. But we are going to hit Lunar. So we need Lunar Magic. 
by Fusoya. Copy. Pasty. And I always put Lunar Magic into my project itself. And I do that because I find that if I have like a single copy of Lunar Magic on my machine, then it's not going to work for all my hacks. Because a specific hack uses a specific version of Lunar Magic, right? <laughs> and if you try to open it with like a down patched version or like the next uh, the, the next version that comes out, things can break. And so I like to like keep it as part of my project. And that way you just, if you want to like upgrade to the next version of Lunar, you can, but you can like make that decision. And uh, otherwise you just use whatever's in your folder. So I've got many copies of Lunar Magic um, on, on my... Ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Yeah, some 101 in, in my projects directory. Okay, so we have Lunar. Let's go ahead and we're also going to grab Pixie. This is the tool for sprite insertion. As you can see, it says right there. Uh, all the way down is the download link. Copy. And what I like to do is I like to make a folder called Pixie. And I like to put it here. Big reason for this is because... <laughs> and of course, it doesn't come with a list file. <laughs> you have to create it. <laughs> but almost all of these tools use list.txt as your input. And it's really obnoxious if you like paste all of your projects or all, like all your tools in one location. And then you're constantly conflicting this list.txt file. It's, uh, it's pretty obnoxious, actually. <laughs> okay. So we got Pixie and we, we're going to do one more, which is Uber ASM. Uber. If anybody knows that reference, feel free to shout it out. <laughs> Uber. So the Uber ASM tool 1.5. Go ahead and download. I cannot believe it's got a 3.5 rating. This is a staple tool right now. <laughs> Uber. Nope. Uber. Pasty. And there we go. So now we got our tool sets. And what we're going to do is we are going to... We're going to grab our ROM that you will clearly already have. <laughs> this is my latest hack. I have it in a single level submissions because it was designed for, uh, for Chambos viewer levels. And so that thing is about ready to be released. I'm excited for that release. And I'll go ahead and paste underscore SMW. And I'm going to copy this and call it ASM 101 or, you know, like the name of your hack. This is now your, yes, the absolute legal copy of SMW. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> um, ASM 101. Yeah. So you can just name it whatever is the name of your hack or your project. That's where this goes. You want to keep uh, a copy of your unmodified uh, ROM as well for flips and stuff like that. And I will just go ahead and open up Lunar Magic. Da, 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 drag this in. And here is what everyone knows as what you first see when you open up Lunar Magic with a new ROM. Cool beans so far. So, first of all, I am going to open up a little tool called Git Extensions. This is what I use. There's a lot of tools out there, by the way. A lot of really good ones uh, that allow you to better control your Git projects. Oops, I need to create a new repository first. Okay. So in here, I'm going to say Git init. 
And what this does is all it does is it initializes an empty git repository. That's it. Easy peasy. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up whatever git UI tool you want to use will help. But this one I found to be one of the best. It's very simple. It's open source. Um, and it has pretty much all of the features in Git right here as a UI. And that's lovely. GitHub has their own one. And it's way simpler to use. So you might want to look at that. But I absolutely love that I can press like commit. And then I can view all of the changes that I'm making to my project right here. And I absolutely love that. And so everything except for Sys Lunar Magic Restore is stuff that I want to put in my project. So if you don't know, Sys LM Restore is where Lunar Magic stores um, backups. And since we're using Git, we don't need that feature. If you still want to enable that, that's fine. But if you're going to be committing version after version after version of backups of your ROM into your Git repository, your repository is going to get really big. So what we're going to do is we're going to ignore everything in the syslm restore folder. So we're going to say code dot, and this is going to open up VS code in this folder. We've used source tree. Yeah, I've used source tree as well. But now I just use Git extensions directly in VS. Oh yeah, Visual Studio 20, 2022. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I haven't used uh, Visual Studio in a while. I use VS Code for everything. Everything. It's just so much lightweight. I like the lightweight these days. And what we're going to do is we're going to add a file called dot git ignore. And what we're going to do is we're going to say sys lm restore. And that's it. So what this says is, and as you can see, um, inside of Visual Studio Code, which I highly recommend you download if you don't have it, this folder goes gray, and everything inside of this folder will be ignored. It'll still be there if you want to use it, that's fine, but you're not going to like upload it to GitHub. So we're going through a lot of stuff like really fast, and the only thing that we're doing is like setting up our workspace. <laughs> so when this uploads to YouTube, I'll probably like segment it so that if people, you know, have their own workspace and whatnot, um, they can just ignore this first part. Okay. So let's go back here. I'm going to re-hit commit and you'll see that we have a git ignore, but we won't have anything. Yep. We won't have anything in that syslm restore anymore because we told Git to just ignore that stuff. VS Code is sh shit for testing, but great for everything else. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> what I use for testing, because I primarily do all of my work in JavaScript and TypeScript, I, uh, I use command line for everything. I just run command line scripts for testing and stuff like that. So, Okay, let us continue. So this is like our initial commit where, where we're just going to stuff all of these files into our repository. So I'm just going to say initial trash, praise the trash. Hit commit and then it's going to ask me, yes, I'm going to stage all the things. And there we go. So we have our first commit into our repository. Now, if we want to push this into our new GitHub repository that we just created, we can copy this, this little link right here. Now we can do all of this in command line, but I'm going to show you remotes. So I can just come here. I can hit manage remotes, name URL. I'm going to call this uh, GitHub. GitHub, save the changes. Yep. Cool. And I already have like my authentication set up in my PC, so you'll probably have to do that as well. All right, so what we did is we actually did our first push. And what push does is it takes all of your commits and actually just copies it up to GitHub. That's all it is. So if I hit refresh, 
and here is my project. It's got all of my stuff in it. So far, so good. So far, so good. All right. We're getting there. Okay. Next up... Can we use tax information to get better at ASM faster? <laughs> we'll get to the ASM very soon. I'm sorry this is like boring shit. This is like setting up a project, but I thought it was actually pretty um, uh, pretty useful once we get there. So there is a couple more steps, but what we're going to do first of all is just kind of introduce the tool set. I'm not going to introduce Lunar because, well, we kind of already did that. It's basically just this. And... Um, Right here. Let me think. I think most people use the tools. Let's just close this. Like so. So if we went into Pixie, actually we're gonna go into Uber first because we're gonna touch Uber first. It's a, it's a little bit easier on the ASM stuff. Boring, but kind of the most important part. Yeah, it's actually pretty important. And it's all going to kind of, it's going to come together really soon once I start putting together these batch files. Okay. So Uber ASM. Very important, super staple part of SMW hacking. It uses ASAR behind the scenes, and it allows you to write code for specific levels. So if you only want to write code that only interacts or is only called, you could say, during one level, but not all of the others. Uber ASM is the the way to do it, I could say. I was going to say it's the only way to do it, but no, definitely not. It's the way to do it, for sure. And by default, it comes with a level list. Uh, it shows you right here what you can do. It's got some test stuff, which is pretty great. And you can put in your ROM file right here. So we're not really going to touch much of anything except just a few lines. What we're going to do is we're going to... I'm probably going to open up, just for reference, a file that I already have just so that I don't misspeak. There we go. In fact, I've got some other things I need to look at as well, which is fine. Here. So here is my list file for... Ah, uh, tea kettle of wet bees, <laughs> which is the hack that I'm about to um about to release. Here's what all this stuff looks like um, for all my levels and all the ASM that I coded for them. Ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. What we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure that we have our SMC file down here. So we'll go down here. We'll open up our. Oops. So we named it ASM 101, and I like to hit F2 and then copy. F2 is the uh, the hotkey to change the name of a file. If you just hit F2 and then you can copy the name, and you can paste it right here. And of course, it's down one folder, so we can say dot dot slash. I know what we're gonna do is we're we're just gonna run over just to make sure we have everything set up correctly. That is all. So I think most people just go into here, and then they double-click on the EXE. And then they kind of look at the output that says code inserted successfully. So right now what we have is a test ASM and a test2.ASM. That's all we have so far. It just comes uh, directly uh, with... Um, um, with Uber, they could download Uber, and all this stuff just comes just comes with it. Let me see. Let me see, Zach. Let me see. <laughs> mm hmm. Congratulations, Dev. I bet that feels really good. Get those uh, get those founder badges while they're hot, everyone. <laughs> Congrats, Dev. There. <laughs> it's 
get some shout outs for dev make sure to get over there if you want a founder's badge they are uh they are on sale for the time being okay let us continue so here's what we got so far um we've got some asm files that come directly with uber asm we've got a project set up and all we have to do is double click on uber we're gonna make this even actually no we're gonna we're gonna keep this the way it is for now However, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, instead of double clicking on Uber, what I like to do is I like to just go into my little command line here. I use CMDER or Commander. It's an emulator. You can download it for free. It just allows you to do things like, you know, DIR or if you want for the Linux version is LS. That's what I prefer. It also comes with tools like grep, if you want to use regular expressions and stuff like that. You don't need to know any of that stuff. It's just, hey, it's a really nice console emulator. <laughs> anyway, CD Uber. And what you can do here is you can say uberasmtool.exe. So instead of double clicking every time, all I have to do now is I, I have to go into my console window, I push up enter up enter up enter so my workflow is starting to get faster so instead of me having to like double click and then go over here and then close the command line after checking things all i have to do is open this up enter and i'm done little things like that are really important to me not having to like manually do repetitive things while i'm trying to get other things done but I suppose that's probably just like me as a programmer. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Elite Fool getting excited over Linux already. Which makes sense. All right. So, where are we at in the stream? We are 36 minutes in. Holy fuck. Should we actually start doing some ASM stuff? We covered like workspace setup. We got Uber going. I think, I think we might be ready, yeah? Are we ready? I think we're ready. I'm actually gonna mark this down. I don't know how to like make like a stream marker. So I'm just gonna write down in the stream itself. Right there, like 37. I'm not ready. Get ready, hops. The ASM awaits. Also, welcome in, bud. <laughs> There. I just made a made a quick note. Marker. Does, is marker a thing? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I have to add it in like in stream elements or something. I don't know. Speaking of, look at the hat. Look at the hat I'm rocking today. Yeah. Alright. We're going to start by doing what most people do in level 105, which is control A, delete. Go here. Whoopsies. Go here, control A, delete. And now I'm going to clear, oh, what is it? Everything. Oh, the new version of Lunar has like little numbers here. I'm not used to the new version of Lunar, but that's okay. We'll figure all this out. <laughs> okay, so midway, I'm gonna bring this guy all the way back. Okay, now we basically have a clean level. It's got nothing in it at all. And obviously, so that we don't die immediately, we'll go ahead and add some ground. Make an amazing little level. Make some pretty little ground. Do we have any pretty little trees? No, but we got some pretty little bushes. Yeah. Does the bush need a friend? The bush needs a friend. We all need a friend. <laughs> no cement blocks. Okay, okay, okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We can't we can't have a good design level without cement blocks, right? <laughs> right There's some cement blocks. Okay. We'll go ahead and start Mario like right here. Here is our level. Looks great, right? Looks great. <laughs> 
Oh, it's not Nightbot behavior. Okay, I don't think I have Nightbot. Like, I think all I have is stream elements. That's it. <sighs> so, <laughs> there's definitely some things I need to I need to work out. Okay, so we're on level 105. We have our tools installed. Let's go back to our list file. We're just going to delete 106 because we're not using it. We're going to see what we have here is we have level 105 test.asm. And test.asm is in level. I'm going to go ahead and delete test2. We'll look at test.asm. Makes Mario crazy. It does indeed make Mario crazy. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, let's think. What is the first example that we want to like program in? Maybe the first thing we should do is jump over to our new best friend, the memory map. Let's show the memory map. Come on, come on over, there we go. So here is our memory map. This is everyone's new best friend. Get used to it. <laughs> it is... Uh, oh, God. Uh, is it required? Not really. It's not. But it's a, it's a massive library of, like, everything. It's not everything. There are some things that it's missing, I've found. Um, but a ton of stuff that's both in the actual ROM file, like locations of different data, and locations of like routines that you can call and the ram so like when the rom is executing what types of memory values do what and how can you manipulate them so for example this is where we're going to start because it's the easiest by far current player power up status is 19 it's, you know, 70, 0, 0, 19. But if you only reference things in Uber or Pixie by just 19, I might be mistaken, but I'm fairly certain that Uber ASM, Asar, and Pixie interpret that as a 70, 0, 0, 19. That's generally just how it works. It's, it's like a nice little feature for all of us. Welcome in, uh, GB. I hope you enjoy. I hope you, if, if you want to learn a thing or two today, feel, uh, feel free. And also feel free to ask as many questions as you want. Okay, let's see here. Make a bullet bill, only fire, right? Uh, I, I know where that's going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or move faster. <laughs> or a spiny stay on a ledge. That actually wouldn't be hard. But we're going to start with the basics of the basics today. <laughs> Absolute basics of the basics. Okay, so what we're going to do today is say you want to make a level where in this particular level, Mario starts with a power-up, but you don't want the, the, like the power-up, you don't want to like just give them the power-up right away because that you know creates a little pause. You want them to just have it when you start the level. This is about as basic as it gets, and there's only going to be like one or two lines of code. So, this is the memory address that we're going to be modifying. It's the current player power-up status. It's 19. So let's go to our code. We're going to delete all the things. So, in Uber ASM and in Pixie as well, there's an init routine. I'll go over to RTL in a second. And there's a main routine. Init gets called once at the very load of the level. Main gets called every single frame while the level is running. So, if we only want to give Mario, say, a mushroom at the start of the level. In fact, I'm going to go into the level and I'm going to create a way for Mario to take damage. Boop -a -doo, boop -a -doo. Go away, bush. There. Okay, so now we have a way to take damage. What we're going to do is we're going to... Um, 
I'm going to go back to the memory map and I'm going to show... Oopsies. Here we are. Yeah. So some of these uh, addresses have this little valid values over here. Not all of them have this. But if you click on that, it shows zero is small, one is big, two is cape, and three is fire. Anything other than that can actually kind of screw up the game, which is fun. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to load in the value of zero, one. We're all thinking in hex right now, not in decimal. We're thinking in hexadecimal. The value of zero, one into the address of 1919, if you will. But remember, hexadecimal, the one, the address right after 19 is 1A. So kind of get your brain thinking in, in hex a little bit. Okay, back here. So in order to... <laughs> okay, I'm just going to write the code and then I'm going to go over, I'm going to draw a picture for all you, for all you guys. We're going to LDA01. Okay. This means load LD into, into the A register, the value, the constant value of one. Now, if I said LDA01 without that little pound in front, what it's gonna do is it's gonna read the memory address 01, 7E0001 to be, to be exact. And it's gonna load that value into A, whatever that happens to be. We don't want to do that. We want a constant of 01. And then what we're going to do is we're going to store that, store A into 19. Now, right here, if I stored it into constant 19, I'm pretty sure that just wouldn't work. It doesn't make any sense to store a value into a constant. I just, I, it wouldn't make any sense. But what we're going to do is we're going to store this value into memory address 19. And again, it's technically 70, 0, 0, 19 but we don't need to, to write all that out. Okay, well, why don't we just go ahead and run this, and then I'll try to explain these instructions a little bit more. And hopefully that'll help. So again, all I'm gonna do is push up, hit enter, and we didn't get any errors. Code inserted successfully. Why don't we go ahead and give this a try and see what happened. Uh, really quick, I will go over the emulator setup if you don't have this set up uh, in Lunar Magic, I highly recommend you do this. Highly recommend. So the emulator path, RetroArch, and then command line arguments is dash L. Then you put in the core, which is snes 9 xlibretrodll It's just inside your cores directory for RetroArch. And then you put in uh, percent one, and that's where it's gonna inject the ROM name. And all you have to do now is just push F4 and it's gonna open up your stuff. So you'll never have to like manually open up your emulator anymore. Very important again to just, uh, uh, I think we're over here, to just make your process nice and fast. Okay, let's take a look. We're gonna load up the level. And hey, what do you know? We're big, we have a mushroom. So I think our code worked well, yeah? And remember, we put our code in the init function, which means that this code only executed once. I'm gonna go ahead and take damage. And what happened is I got a mushroom at the very start of the level, but after that, nothing else is executed. And I can go ahead and die like normal. What happens if I took this code, oops, this code here, and I put it in the main function instead? Remember, the main function gets executed every single frame, right? Let's go ahead and give that a shot. Just rerun it by pushing up and enter. Alt-Tab a few times, hit F4. We can actually reload our save state as long as it's on the overworld and the level hasn't been loaded yet. And now I'm big. And I'm still big. <laughs> and I'm still big. I can sit here forever. <laughs> Super fun mechanic, right? Because <laughs> remember, setting uh, that value of 19 to 1 is happening every single frame, right? So regardless of whether or not I'm taking damage, every frame, we're, we're, we're mashing 1 into that, into that address. And so I will... Unless I probably hit like a death block or something that kills me instantly. I'm never really going to die unless, you know, you fall down a hole or something. 
So let's talk about these instructions a little bit. That is basically kind of ASM 101, you could say, is right here. We can go into a little bit more complex um, uh, examples, and then we'll start talking more and more about uh, sprites. We're going to get into sprites a little bit later on. And hopefully, if I can, if time permits, we can actually start talking about like smaller versions of boss fights and things like that as well. Okay, let's think. Where are we at? Right. We're going to open up paint. Paint is great. Okay. I had no idea the inner dev loop was this tight. This is awesome. Okay. Hey, thumbs up. <laughs> thumbs up. But yeah, so again, like, if, if you were around earlier on, GB, um, this is kind of like how I do things. Everyone does things different. And as, as I know how much you know, coding is an art form. There's like an infinite amount of ways to solve a problem. So this is just kind of my process. <laughs> you, don't, uh, you don't have to do everything, that's for sure. Okay. So, in assembly, there's a number of things you have access to. Um, and my, I'm only going to show you a couple of them today. And this picture might actually not be 100% accurate. <laughs> but this is how my brain works. So there's that. Over here, we've got this big ass block and we're going to call it memory. Let's, let, oh, 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 let's zoom in. Memory. Yeah. And then over here, we've got a... We're going to make it like that. And we're going to call it a stack. And then down here, you've got registers. And these are actually like, I believe, physical parts of the processor. So we're going to call this. Yeah, I'm going to draw out a couple of these. I'm going to say the A register. The A stands for the word accumulator. That's not really important. It's just your A register. A register. You've got a few more, but again, I'm only going to show you a certain amount of things today. X register. And your Y register all right this is i mean you've got access to more things but again this is all i want to show you for today <laughs> there's there's more stuff that's more involved but i want to kind of keep things a little bit more simple okay your a register it is either 8 bits or 16 bits, depending on the status of your processor. We're only going to stay in 8 bit mode today. So we're just going to say this is one byte. 8 bits. A register is just one byte long. One byte. Same as your X, same as your Y. All of these are just one byte long. You can load data into them. You can use them in certain ways. You can grab the data from them and store them in different memory locations. That's basically what ASM typically does. As you can, as you remember seeing, all we did to change Mario's power-up status was just write to memory value 19. That's it. So memory is this massive hunk of blocks that all kind of look like this and so on and so forth. This is memory address 00. This is memory address 01, 02, 03, and dot, 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 dot. You could just say that this is like 0F. Um, and it just kind of keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. And a lot of these memory addresses are used by vanilla SMW. A lot of them are used by um, tool sets, like Pixie, um, like like in Pixie, you've got like that extra byte data. It uses certain memory addresses that are considered free RAM to inject extra data into your into your sprites for you, which is really nice. And you, as the 
uh, developer or hacker have access to all of this stuff. So you can manipulate things, break things, <laughs> or use any of the free RAM that you might want. So, I don't know why I'm drawing. I shouldn't be drawing. This is stupid. <laughs> Let's continue. The stack, I'm going to get this wrong because I don't actually understand the intricate details of the stack. It might actually just be another hunk of memory, or it might exist inside of memory somewhere. I don't really know. But just think of it as a literal stack. When you push onto the stack, uh, let me let me try to make an analogy. Um, and this is what we had. This is this is what a professor gave me back in college as an analogy as well. This is. <laughs> say you're working at a restaurant and in order for the customers of that restaurant to get a plate from a stack of plates there's this spring loaded uh, there's this spring loaded like a, you could say stack so whenever you got a bunch of clean dishes you can push it down into this spring loaded stack of dishes and then a customer will get the first one from the top. And then say you've got another clean dish, and so you put it on the top, and you push down the spring-loaded stack. And so, this is called a first-in, first-out stack. Or FIFO for short. FIFO, first-in, first-out stack. So basically what that means is, if I pushed a data, a, a piece of data onto a stack right here, it's going to go to the top. But then if I push another one, like the value of O2 onto the stack as well, O1 then gets pushed down to here, while this is O2. But then if I take a plate from the, stock, from the, from the top, then O2 gets removed, and then O1 jumps back up to the first position. Again, the hardware details I'm a little fuzzy of, but that is how stacks basically work in uh, in processors or computer architecture, you could say. Okay. If there's any questions about that, please let me know. But that's kind of how the stack works. You can push things on top of the stack. You can pull things off the top of the stack. But that's about it. There's probably ways to like manipulate different things as part of the stack, but you don't really want to. You want to use it kind of as intended, and it's there for, for particular reasons. We'll get into that. Okay. So far, so good. We have A register, X register, Y register, a big chunk of memory, and a stack. That's it. For now. That's it. <laughs> All right. So, not terribly important, but stacks are LIFO. Qs are FIFO. Last in, first out? Oh, you're right. You're right. First in. Well, the first in would be the first out if you pulled it. No, you're right. You're right, GB. You're right. Thank you for correcting me. It's LIFO. It's last in, first out. Yep. I, my brain was just thinking a little bit backwards. They're not FIFO. They're LIFO. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the last plate that you stack onto the, onto the, the stack of plates, the spring-loaded stack, is the first one that gets pulled off when somebody wants to use it. But you're right. You're right, GB. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> okay. So now we've explained, um, like, the different pieces of hardware that we can use. Now let's go over some of these instructions, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put a link in chat, and I'll probably put it in the YouTube video as well. Give me one moment. This is the op code. Here they are. I'm gonna go ahead and put this in chat, and I'll probably paste this somewhere else as well. So this is a really really good definition of 65816 assembly. And that is the instruction set that the Super Nintendo uses. 
And it's got, I think, pretty much all of the instructions that you have access to. So like the things that we just used were LDA, load accumulator from memory. Really what that means is memory gets loaded into A, your A register. And there's a lot of different ways to use this. Like what we just did was a const. So LDA01, remember with that pound, it makes this a constant value instead of loading from a memory address. And you can also do uh, different types of memory addresses. You can do, I'm not gonna go over stuff like this, but we, we're, we're definitely gonna be using indexes today. And I'll talk about those more when we get into sprites. But basically what this means is, hey, you can load, uh, for example, memory address 00, zero but then you want to add an index to that and say if your index is 1, you're going to be adding 1 to it, and so you're actually going to be loading in memory address 0, 01. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then we have sta, which is store A into memory. And so we'll kind of go up and we'll just take a look at what that says. Yep, so accumulator goes loaded into memory. And again, there's a lot of different ways you can use it, including the uh, indexes. But what we just used was store address. That's all we just used just now. So we stored our A value right here into 19. And there's other op codes that you can use for different addresses. Up it up it up it up it up it up. Here we are. So there's also there's store A. There's also store X. There's store Y, and there's actually store zero. So instead of saying, hey, if you wanted to like clear out a memory value, um, what you could do is load the constant zero and then store A, which is zero, into whatever memory addresses you wanted. You could actually just say STZ, which is store zero into memory. It's just kind of a faster way to store zero into a memory space. Okay, let us continue. So why don't we... Let's think. What's like the next thing we want to do, very simplistic with Mario, that we can just... Whoops, that is the wrong lunar magic. <laughs> there we go that we can just kind of show more progression. Um, let's think, let's think, let's think. If, why don't we, why don't we take um, Leet's suggestion that he had a bit ago? I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna leave that in. And what we're gonna do is we're going to kill the player on power up. Very silly little level. But I think it's a really good example of kind of how to go through more different types of, as of assembly op codes. I'm going to put this here, we're going to put this here, and we're going to put this here, maybe a little bit spaced out so it's a little bit easier. Okay. So yeah, the, the mechanic here, gimmick, if you want to call it a gimmick, that's totally fine, is going to be the player will die. Not, not get damaged, but will die whenever uh, Mario touches a power-up. Fun little say little mechanic, right? Let's go ahead and code that in. So, well, actually, I want to talk about RTL real quick just because that's in here and I want to make sure that we include it. So let's see, yeah, RTS and RTLs return from subroutine. Um, basically, if your code is called by JSL, which is jump to subroutine from a long address, then you have to return with an RTL. If your code is called uh, by a JSR, which is jump to subroutine, that's what it stands for, in a shorter in a shorter type of jump, then you have to use RTS to get back. 
there are ways around that rule, <laughs> but it's very complicated and we're not going to get into it today. <laughs> I had to use it on a couple different things, but it's, it's kind of hairy, I'm not going to lie. So that's basically the rule. It's just, here's a function that you're writing, here's the return. That's all it is. So like if you're using, you know, or if you're thinking about a, a more modern language, Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, what have you, it's just a return. That's all it is. But you have to make sure that you're using the correct return opcode. It's either going to be RTS or RTL. Now, if your code is enacted by jump, then things get a little hairier, but we're not going to be using those a whole lot today, if, if any, um, because I like to keep the code a little bit more clean because jumps feel more like go-tos and where jumps are more efficient uh, with CPU cycles, subroutines give you that feeling of contained functions and it's just much, much cleaner in my opinion. Okay, why don't we go ahead and jump into the code? So, we want Mario to die if Mario touches a power-up. And so what we're not going to be doing is checking if Mario uh, is like in a collision space with a power-up. Power up. All we're going to be doing is we're going to be checking address 19 for anything that's not zero. That's it. So why don't we go ahead and do that? Now again, we want this code to execute as the player is progressing through the level. So it needs to be in the main function, not in the init function. So we're going to LDA 19. And again, what that does is it loads into the A register, the accumulator, the memory address 19. So this is going to be a value of 0 to 2. 0 to 2. 0 is small. 1. I'm sorry, 0 to 3. 0 to 3. So it goes small, big, cape, flower. Okay. So how do we check... If this value, remember it's in our A register right now. How do we check if this value is anything except zero? So we can look at our opcodes. That's one thing we can do. And we can grab an opcode called compare. Now we don't need to do this right now because we're checking for zero. But I'm not going to take shortcuts. I, I just want to show what these opcodes are. <laughs> what we can do is we can say compare. And you can see the flags that are affected. So basically what compare does, it's kind of a glorified subtract. It does accumulator minus memory, but it doesn't actually change any values except for the Z flag. I won't go into detail too much about the Z flag. Actually, I will. I lied. <laughs> there is a Z flag. And all you really need to know is that the Z flag is updated every single frame. And it's actually updated every single opcode. Like anything that might change uh, A from zero or non-zero, this flag gets set. Um, so what that means is say you load in memory address 19. If you load it in the value zero, this Z flag gets set. If you load it in the value of something else, that Z flag gets cleared. And that kind of goes, um, that kind of goes, yeah, that kind of goes for like every single different type of opcode that you use. The Z flag is just, uh, it's continuously updated. Okay, so again, you don't really need to do CMP00, but I'm going to do it anyway because I just want to show the process. Okay, we're going to LDA19. We're going to compare it against zero. And then what we need to do is we need to create an if statement in assembly. It needs to be, if it's zero, do this stuff. If it's not zero, do this other stuff. So how do we handle that in assembly? We can do that right now. So we're going to go back to our opcodes. We're going to look at branches right here. There's a whole series of them. 
But what we're going to do is we're going to check Beck. Yeah, Beck should be fine. So if you see here, branch if equal, which really means if your Z flag is set to one. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. So if we say branch if equal, meaning 19 and the constant of zero equal each other, meaning if 19 is zero, then we're gonna go ahead and branch to a different segment of code. And we're gonna, and I'm gonna put a dot here and I'll explain that in a second. We're gonna call this um, player lives because if the power up status is zero, then we don't want to kill the player, right? And we'll just kind of go down here. We'll say player, player lives. So right now what we've got is we loaded in the power up status, compared it to zero. If it was zero, then we're going to jump down to this line here. And we're going to kick out of the code because here we have an RTL. All right. So here in the middle, here, and of course, these are comments, by the way. If you put a little semicolon in front of a line, you can write out anything that you want, and it better explains what your code is doing. Here, the player has a power-up status that is non-zero. So we're going to kill the player. Evil face. So how do we actually kill the player. Luckily, there is a routine defined in the memory map, and we can find it really quickly. Routines are stored in the ROM, not in the RAM. And we can find it quickly by searching for death. So here's a Mario death pose. It's really just a tile map. Death subroutine, JSL to it to kill Mario. Pretty handy, huh? So what we're going to do is, is we're going to copy this. Again, it's a subroutine. It already tells us that it's JSL. What that means is at the very end of this subroutine, it has an RTL at the end. So remember the rule set is if it has an RTL at the end, you have to call it by JSL, not JSR. So that is, is like the basic rule set there. So what we're going to do is we're going to JSL jump to long subroutine or jump to subroutine long. And we're just going to put in that address. And that's it. I was wondering if shared routines would have to, to declare which jump to use. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a way to like tell the consumer of a routine, hey, this is what you need to do. I don't think that exists. <laughs> I think you just kind of have to know. <laughs> So that's kind of fun. <laughs> and again, um, if there is a routine, it was docked there. Yes, 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 yes. So like in code, there's no really way to know unless you kind of like trial and error, I think, or disassemble the ROM and take a look. But yes, right inside the memory map, it will tell you sometimes. <laughs> like again, this memory map is not 100% complete. But where it exists, it's really nice when it tells you. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> really nice when it tells you. So yeah, again, we grab the ROM address here. And we're just going to jump to that. And then again, at the very end of this routine, it's got an RTL, which will return back to this line right here. And we could invoke more code right here. Uh, we could do more stuff here uh, after the death routine completes. Okay, so to recap, we've got some code. We loaded in the power up status of 19, compared it to zero. If it was zero, we just branched down here, which is a kind of a glorified go-to, which is fine. And we return immediately. Otherwise, we go into this function we are not function this this block we kill the player by jumping to a routine that's defined out on the memory map called the death routine 
and then once that's done, we again come down here and we and we return. Why don't we go ahead and run this and see if we broke anything? So it looks like there's been no issues, so why don't we go ahead and just run it? Again, whoopsies. Yep, again, you can always use save states uh, as long as the level itself wasn't loaded yet. Okay, so so far we're not dying, right? So that means that that branching seems to work. <laughs> that was kind of fucking silly. <laughs> I like that. So yeah, if we have anything that's not zero, we will die. <laughs> it's kind of fun, actually. <laughs> It's kind of fun to see, like, the little animations of you getting the power-up and then dying immediately. <laughs> it's kind of fun. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, props to Leap for this idea, by the way, because it's, like, a... It's a very simple mechanic, and it allows, like, for, you know, good educational purposes, I would say. <laughs> so, yeah... Anyone in chat, if you have any questions about this, please let me know. Otherwise, we can keep going. So let's think. Um, something regarding speed. Let's do some speed stuff. Let's do some speed stuff. So what we're going to do now is actually something kind of similar. Everything non-audio is synchronous. Correct. Correct, GB. Yes. Um, there's only one thread. And code gets executed like one line after the other. Yeah. So you do have to keep things in mind. Um, you really don't have to keep things in mind. <laughs> but if this code was insanely inefficient. And this is running every single frame you're going to start getting a lot of slowdown, even though you don't have a lot of sprites loaded on the screen. Because it's like extra execution that you're doing. So you have to, I mean, it'd be good to keep those things in mind, but it's not a huge issue unless you've got some really serious code inefficiency problems. Basketball game? Okay. Have fun at the basketball game, Lee. I hope it's an awesome, awesome time for your family. But yeah, there's definitely going to be a VOD. Um, I'll definitely upload it to YouTube uh, for permanent sake. So, yeah. Okay, let's continue. Um, we're going to talk about Mario Speed because Mario Speed is also one of those things that it's like very common to manipulate or read and do stuff with. And it's stored in a very particular way. And I'll talk about that. Let's see here. Why don't we go to our RAM? We're going to look at Mario Speed. And I'm going to set the length to one. Yes, to one. Because I know that Mario Speed is actually only one byte. And there's also uh, a lot of sprite speeds, which is going to be 12 bytes. But we'll talk about that stuff when we get into... Um, when we get into sprite stuff later on player block status is very good for detecting if we're like on the ground and whatnot here it is so pixel frame yep 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 okay so this is the player's x speed uh it's a address 7b and look at this it says 8 bit two compliments signed blah 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 pixel per frame I don't think that's very important. So, any any number between 0 and FF is left speed. On the camera, I don't know if the camera actually looked like it was going right, but <laughs> is left speed with 80 is the fastest. 0 means not moving at all, and anything between 1 and 7F means rightward speed with 7F is the fastest. We're going to open up paint again. It's really good to think of it like this. Yeah. Kind of like that. So this is like zero, zero. And this is like FF. And right in the middle, 
is 80. So this is kind of how speed works, not only for Mario, but also for sprites. If you're zero, you're not moving. If you're 01, you're moving just a little bit to the right. Yes, to the right. <laughs> and over here, it's what, uh, F-E? Um, FF means you're going to the left, but you're doing it in the, the slowest possible way you can. But then if you get all the way up here to 80, 80 means the most left word speed you can possibly get. And 7F on this side is the most rightward speed you can possibly get. So that's kind of how speed works in, in this game. And again, that, that is how Mario works and that's also how sprites work. Aw, Chambo gave me a shout out. I don't know if Chambo is lurking, but thank you. I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, we're doing some we're doing some ASM learning with Bucket today. Cause there's not a lot of videos about ASM. There's just not. There's a few. <laughs> I don't think the sunglasses line up well, Zach. <laughs> Yo, Thea, welcome in. Welcome in. Okay, so that's how speed works. What we're going to do is we're going to read the speed if we're going at a specific uh, rate. Like if we're going fast enough, we're going to kill Mario. <laughs> Killing Mario or like altering the power-up status is like the best way to like uh, debug your code, by the way. It's like, is this code being uh, triggered? Give him a cape, and then you can you can like know if it's actually being hit. <laughs> Master Lurker is here, the chosen bean. Hey, the beans bot chose you the other day in, in Hops' stream. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> okay. So remember, we have 7B. I'm just going to go ahead and copy 7B. Minimize. And one thing I'm going to do up here is introduce constant variables. You can't debug dot log here. You cannot, GB. I can show you um, a little application that I wrote uh, probably later, um, but I actually don't have it available publicly. But anyway, what it does is it actually reads RetroArch and constantly spits out memory values so you can see what's changing and whatnot. That was a weird little... Let's go over here. So you can see what's changing and what isn't. And it's super helpful uh, for like really complex things. But for things that are simple, um, for example, if, uh, if Mario wasn't dying and we're trying to like debug things, one thing I would probably do right away is just like LDA 02 sta 19. And then that would tell me immediately if this chunk of code was actually being executed, whether Mario was gonna get a cape or not. It's just a good way to debug things. Okay. I'm going to introduce constant variables. These are not required, incredibly important. So they start with an exclamation point, and then you can put in whatever name you want. Let's put in address, because it's actually a memory address. Um, Mario X speed equals... Up. And so basically what this is, is it's kind of a macro variable. It, you can think about it in really any way you want. But really all this is, is any time that I have this hunk of text, it's going to be replaced behind the scenes as uh, the address 7B. So now I don't really have to remember 7B anymore while this macro is defined. I can just use this. And what's really nice is that in um, the uh, VS Code or perhaps another like a uh, coding environment that you're using, I can say things like LDA 
address, and as you can see, it pops up right there. And I can just hit tab, and it's much faster for me. I don't have to remember 7B. All I have to remember is I have a, you could say, a variable named up here, address Mario X speed. So we're gonna be using those a lot, especially when we get into sprites. Maybe soon, maybe soon. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna check Mario's X speed. And if Mario is going fast enough in one direction, and then we're gonna include the other direction, I'll show you how to do that. Then we're gonna kill Mario. This is gonna be, if somebody uses this code at Nakaiza level, it's gonna be awful. Truly, truly awful. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to modify our code, but I'm just going to kind of push this down here for now because we're still going to need this line of code to kill the player. We're going to LDA, address Mario X speed. So we're going to load in that, uh, that address. We're going to compare it to something. Maybe we could create another variable, hey? So let's go back up to our memory map. We're going to take a look here. Remember, so rightward speed... The fastest is 7F. When, you, when you've got P-Speed, I'm pretty sure... Oh, right, it's actually going to explain it right here. Yeah, right here. It never actually gets even close to 7F. <laughs> you can move Mario at 7F speed if you want to in code, but you'll never get all the way to 7F if you're just playing the game. But it looks like you'll never get even above 31. <laughs> It's 2F to 31. The oscillation, speed oscillation, you'll, you'll hear uh, hack developers talk about that a lot. Due to code, applying deceleration when Mario is at or above the max speed, rather than just setting the speed to the max value. Yay, SMW code. Go fast, e das. That's right, Thea. That's absolutely right. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to check is maybe if it's above 2E? Because if it's between 2F and 31, that means you're pretty much at the max speed. And it's going to be constantly fluctuating, but you're at the max speed at that point. So why don't we, why don't we check 2E? And we're going to make another variable, because why not? So it's not an address, it's just going to be a constant value. So I was just going to call this, um, maybe I'll just, I'll just say in constant, constant... Uh, kill Mario threshold, threshold, speed. I like to try and make things very verbose so that it's nice and clear what they are. Maybe that's not clear. I don't know. Remember, this is a constant, so we're going to put a pound in front instead of an address. And we're going to be looking for 2E. And we'll see if this works. Maybe it will right away. Maybe it won't. And I like to keep these things kind of separate. Like you can say address constants... And then down here, we can say value constants. And then down here is like init method. And then down here is main method. This is usually how I document. And obviously, um, saying the words main method right above main isn't really helpful. But, you know, I'd add more descriptions with more complicated things. <laughs> okay. We're going to load in Mario's X speed. We're going to compare it against our constant. Kill Mario threshold. Speed. And then we need to go and view our branches again. Because if it's greater than our threshold, greater than our threshold, that's when we want to kill Mario. So why don't we jump around to here. Branches. So, we've got carry branches, we've got equal, not equal branches, we've got minus branches, and plus branches. So, we could use either plus or minus for this. And we're going to continue using player lives. So, I'm actually going to change this to 2 F instead of 2E. And what we're going to do is we're going to say anything below 2F, not including 2F, is going to make Mario survive. Is this bucket with a ball gag? What? <laughs> what? 
Oh, God, you're replying. I was like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> that emote? I mean, why not? Why not? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So we're going to branch if minus. <laughs> Which is BMI. Branch if minus. Two dot player lives. Which means that anything down here is Mario's speed going to be 2F or greater. So we can just go ahead and try this right now. We can try this right now. There we go. Looks like there was no errors. Code inserted successfully. Let's go ahead and give it a shot. Uh, we're going to remove some stuff so that we can build up speed pretty easily. We're going to put a muncher like over here. Now, we only checked rightward speed. We'll talk about leftward speed in just a moment. All right. Well, we didn't die yet. We're not dying yet. But if I just start running to the right. <laughs> All right. There we go. <laughs> it looks like we actually broke the game a little bit. <laughs> but I suppose the code is in general working as, as intended. <laughs> Let's see. I'm guessing it's because we can talk about the issue a little later, but I think the, the code is overall working. Uh, let's show leftward speed real quick, and we should be able to show that it doesn't work for leftward speed, and then we can talk about that. Got to love how I announce my presence in your chat. Yeah. I'm going to go a little bit slower over here. And then we're going to run to the left. Yeah, so I can get P-Speed going to the left without dying. But if I get P-Speed going to the right, I die. <laughs> so, what if we wanted to update our code to also kill the player if we're going to the left? Now, one way to do that is to modify this to both check the X-Speed and the right speed, but there's also another trick. There's another trick. Let me, let me see, is there another trick? Let's play a little bit, let's play a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to <laughs> Eeyore over FF. This is going to get a little complicated. Just stick with me for a minute. Eeyore, FF, and we're going to increment by one. Now this is wh what this is going to do is this is actually going to check leftward speed. And I'll try to explain why in just a sec. It flips everything over to the other side is basically what happens. At least I hope that's what's going to happen. <laughs> Let's go. And bucket 96 ball gag. <laughs> so we're checking right speed. We're all good. Let's check left speed. And we die right away. <laughs> so that is typically how I handle both left and right speeds. I typically Eeyore it against FF. All right. What does Eeyore do? <laughs> Let's open up our, uh, our op codes. Right here. Exclusive or accumulator with memory. This is kind of... <laughs> we can open up paint. All right, all right, all right, all right. If we had the value, zero, 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 one, Zero, 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 0001 we're going to e or this against ff and ff is 1111111111 all right we're going to use eor eor stands for exclusive or this is a what's it called a, a bitwise operation is that what it's called or a binary not binary boolean Boolean logic. So or would be if one bit or the other bit is true, 
make it one. And would be, if both of them are one, then your output is one. Exclusive or means one or the other, but not both. So the output of Eeyore is gonna transform this data down here into this. So let's just look at these rows or that these columns here. One one would, would get a zero because you're not allowed to have both. So what happened to the data? It basically just completely flipped over. So instead of zero 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 one, we have one 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 zero. Zero 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 one 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 zero. And so with Eeyore against FF, it basically takes your data and just completely flips the bits around. And because of how uh, little Indian is the correct term, or Endian, little Endian maybe is the, is the correct term, um, because of how the data is stored in that bit, this is now our leftward speed. Another way to do this would be to not do this method, but would also be to simply just define another variable for leftward speed and then compare against that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a little comment here. What we're gonna say is we're gonna check the rightward speed. Check rightward speed. There's definitely gonna be a fancier, more efficient way to do both checks at once. I'm not going to do that because I want this to be nice and easily read readable. <laughs> Check rightward speed. And I'm going to change this to not say player lives. I'm going to change this to say player dies. And I'm going to move this down here. And then I'm going to put another label down here called dot return. Bitwise operator is right. Cool. Cool. Okay. So, X word speed if we are branch if plus. So, I changed player lives to player dies. So, instead of having Mario moving at less than to kill him, I'm going to be moving at greater than to kill him. So, if we are greater than 2e, we're going to kill the player. Or if we put another check down here, I'm just gonna copy paste the code and we're gonna say leftward speed, Eeyore against FF, and then compare, oh, and increment, Eeyore FF increment by one. And we increment by one because zero, zero is reserved for no speed at all. And there's, uh, there's no comparison on the right-hand side for leftward speed that represents zero. So we have to account for that. So we order against FF, we increment. And then if we are less than that threshold. I also need to invert the threshold, don't I? Huh. Yeah, we'll play around, we'll play around. But it needs to be if it's less than. <laughs> so BMI, player dies. Now, once we get down here, this is after all of our checks. We don't want to kill the player. So brah is branch always. You just always branch. And we'll go ahead and take a look at that real quick. Let me get caught up here. Hey, Fry. Welcome in. I'm doing a assembly 101 with chat today. <laughs> so branches, B-R-A is branch always. So I, what I'm doing is I'm checking speed. I'm checking speed. If they do either one of those checks, we're going to kill the player. But if not, I don't want to just come down here and then just fall into this player dies uh, label anyway. We want to skip over it. So I say branch always down to the return. 
Fry Landy's nuts. I think this is wrong, but that's okay. We can still kind of play around a little bit. Go ahead and close. Okay. Let's give this a shot. Yo, Baba. Welcome in. Yep, I'm trying to teach some nerds. <laughs> Including myself. Alright. <laughs> so we died immediately. And I'm pretty sure that's because of this right here. I need to change this. So we grab Mario's X speed. Ah, uh, I think I know why. So I don't want to grab Mario's X speed. I think I want to grab the threshold and flip that over is what I want to do. So I'm going to grab, whoopsies, grab the threshold, which again is 2E. I need to flip that over. We're going to Eeyore, FF, Inc. We're going to compare that against Mario's X speed. Okay, now which direction? So our threshold is going to be up there if it's less than the threshold. Yeah. We check the rightward speed. <laughs> this is actually going to be kind of hard. <laughs> this is going to be a complicated, uh, a complicated example, unfortunately, because leftward speed I also have to check if it's greater than eighty. <laughs> so this is going to start getting a little more complicated. Yo, Shawnee. Welcome in. So this is probably going to always kill the player. So I, I might just move on to sprites and not, uh, not get into the complexities here. But that's okay. Things are going to break when doing assembly from time to time, and that's all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, Baba, we're just going through some examples of how one could use ASM to make something happen in a level. Uh, we went over um, give the player a mushroom on startup. We went over kill the player if they touched a power-up. And now what I'm just trying to do is, like, if the player's speed is above a certain value, kill the player. Terrible. Terrible ASM. Never do this. <laughs> but this is this is how I would do it. And then we're again, we're just kind of doing some examples today. We're playing around. I'm gonna remove the left speed. Um, just because it's gonna be a little bit more intricate than I originally thought. And again, there's probably an easy way to do it, but I'm trying to keep things simple. <laughs> Not only for for education, but also for my brain as we're going through this stuff. <laughs> So let's go ahead and just do this. We'll take one more quick look, and then we might move on to sprites, because I want to get to sprites. We've been we've been live for, oh my goodness, we're going on two hours here. <laughs> so yeah, let's do this stuff. And we'll go back here. There we go. So basically we run and we die because we ran too fast. <laughs> but yeah. So that is the basics of like loading values into a register, comparing them, branching if different values are greater than, less than, equal, those different types of things. And that's how to do it inside of Uber ASM, which again is a tool for writing code that only uh, that only runs on specific levels. Okay. Sprite sounds so good right now. I can do some Sprite. Yeah. <coughs> okay. We downloaded Pixie. We got our workspace set up a little bit. We're going to go into Pixie and we're going to move forward. First, I'm going to remove that because I actually want to be able to run in the level. Let's go ahead and run. Okay. So I'm going to close this Uber folder. I'm going to open up Pixie. And the ASM is going to look very, 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 very similar, but with like a couple differences. And furthermore, 
uh, we do need to give our own little list file specific to Pixie. So Pixie does not come with a list file. So go ahead and create a list.txt. And how this works is a little different. It does come with a config editor. So the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna be creating a sprite. It's gonna be extremely simple. I'm gonna try to go through like the very basics and then maybe we can build on that. And if we have time and I don't screw things up, <laughs> I can show you how to turn that sprite into like a very simple boss fight. So that's kind of where I'm trying to take this stream today. Okie dokie. All right, let me think. We got Pixie. Let's uh, let's just run it first, just to make sure. Well, it's not going to work because you need a list file and it has to have like something in it, I think. So let me open up another list file I have just for reference, just to make sure I'm not like screwing some things up. Just make Kaiser Three Bowser. That's right. <laughs> That's right. All right. So Pixie Sprite Snoops Projects. Here we are. Here's another list file. So this is my list file for um, for the hack I'm, I'm about to release. Hopefully pretty soon, within the week, maybe within the week. Um, and this is really all it looks like. Uh, sprites have either a config or JSON file, and those are tied to the ASM file that runs them. So there's like configuration for the sprite, and then there's the actual sprite code. So they're kind of broken up in two different files. Not super important right now, but that's okay. So what are we gonna make? Should we should we just make like a, a silly little something? Um I guess I can just call them like sample. Sample.json. Me, duh, we'll make a Thea. We're gonna make a Thea.json. <laughs> and that's gonna be sprite slot zero. These numbers you can just kind of go up. Like, you can start them... I think you'd have to start them pretty low. I don't think you can use, like, the, uh... Like, up in up in the A range, I think, is, like, the uh, the shooters. And maybe the, the cluster sprites. It might blow up if you use those. I'm not sure. But just starting them low and just kind of going up, that's how I work. It, it works pretty easy. Yeah, so we're going to be making a Thea. <laughs> a Thea sprite. First thing we want to do is we open up pixie config editor.exe. You don't really need to do anything. All you need to do is, well, maybe I'll, I'll put in thea.asm. I think I need to say act like one here. I, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think if you have an act like zero, it won't actually execute. It's kind of weird. I might be wrong, but we're gonna we're gonna try some stuff. So we're gonna go as I'm gonna want Pixie sprites. We're gonna call this thea.json. Save. And now that created kind of a boilerplate JSON file for us. And yep, here it is. And it also has asm file thea.asm. So we'll go ahead and create a thea.asm as well. <laughs> we have our JSON file, we have our thea, we have our asm file. Sometimes I like to kind of look at things like this as we're kind of working through things. I no longer play Kaizo. I am Kaizo. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I was going to mention something. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember what it was. That's all right. That's all right. Um, okay, so list.txt00 is going to be thea.json. We've got kind of a boilerplate JSON file. Uh, yeah, yeah, we don't have to worry about like extra bytes and things like that. Um, setting these things allows the user in Lunar Magic to alter the extra, I think it's under like the extension data when you're inserting sprites. You can uh, add in up to extra four extra bytes, I think. And by setting these things allows you to do that. 
<laughs> hey, Bull Run, welcome in. <laughs> Actually allows you to do that. Okay. Let's make a sprite. So if I'm not mistaken, and I should I should definitely open up a sprite for reference, but I think I think there's also an init and main routine for Pixie. And uh, we'll double check these. We'll double check these. <laughs> so one thing I like to do for pretty much all of my routines is say init dot return. Or it's, I, it's RTS, but inside of um, code that's called, you could say by Pixie, but it ends up being called like externally from the actual ROM itself. You got to return with RTL. And then main dot return RTL. I'm pretty sure this is the just kind of how things start. We have our list file. And now what we're going to do is we're just going to try and run this real quick just to see if we can get things uh, inserted in and executing. There might be issues. If so, we can fix those up. So I'm going to go ahead and run Pixie like normal. And then I'm going to show you one trick. Uh, it's just a batch file to run things much, much quicker. So Pixie, you typically double click on it and then you kind of move things down here. It says, or drop the ROM here. So we'll go down here. We'll go to ASM. Before I do this, before I do this, create a snapshot. Before Pixie, create a snapshot of your work. And this includes your ROM and all of the ASM that we have been working with so far. So all of that is now backed up. <laughs> cool. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna drag in ASM 101, hit enter. Couldn't open the list file for reading. <laughs> yup. That's because Pixie expects by default, by default, the list file to live in the same location as your ROM file. Which to me, I don't know if that was a great decision, but that's okay. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna create a batch file. Yeah, text document is fine. We're gonna call it run.bat. This just makes things so much easier. Here's our run.bat. And I'm actually gonna open up another one and I'm just gonna copy some stuff over. Pick C. Uh, run.bat, and here it is. pixie.exe-l list file. <laughs> and as you notice right here, it's interpreting this argument as the same folder as your ROM. So you need to open up pixie to find the list file. But the second argument is interpreted as the same folder as pixie.exe. It's weird. It's very weird. But that's just how it works. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and put in asm101.smc here. There. <coughs> ah, okay. So now we have a batch file. And what we can do instead as we can go into the pixie directory and just say run. And now all I have to do is type run whenever I make any changes and it will just kind of go through things very quickly. Okay. So now I think what we can do is we can reopen up Lunar. And if I'm not mistaken, so the collection here is empty, but let's see if, if um, Lunar finds anything. I think we need to add something into the collection, and I'll show you about that as well. So after reopening up Lunar, we come down. Yep, so we came all the way down to the sprites window. We didn't see anything here. Now we can still insert the sprite by going into sprite mode and hitting insert. And now I can put in what would work is zero, zero with extra bits of two. This is actually our Thea sprite. But I want it to show up here just to make things nice and easy. And to do that, I'm, a, I'm again going to open up something for reference. 
But I think it's just, you just need to add something into the collection here. And you're good to go. So let's continue there. Sprites. I have a, yep, the Baby Yoshi definitely has a bunch of collections. There's a display collection. Here, why don't we, uh, let's copy the display. Because <laughs> that way I think Thea's going to look like a Baby Yoshi. Because, you know, why not? <laughs> And we're going to call this a Thea Sprite. I'm going to get rid of all this extra text. <laughs> Rage. Thea Sprite. Extra bit false. Tiles. Map 16 tile. This just uh, whatever Lunar Magic decides to put in there. You're just telling Lunar to give it a, a visual. And then collection. We'll go ahead and copy this. And we'll just say, yes, right. And the extra bytes don't mean anything. I don't know if I have to have them here, but I'll just make them all zero. That's fine. There. So we'll go ahead and re-import by hitting up, enter. It just reruns the run batch file. And then if we reopen our ROM, now we've got our Thea sprite right here. And again, because of that little displays, Thea is now a baby Yoshi. <laughs> so the the custom sprite command is 0x2, uh, just like what we were showing with the, um, the custom insert. If I put this here, it shows up as a baby Yoshi. It, it won't show up as anything uh, when we run the game because I'm offended. <laughs> because we haven't actually created a graphic subroutine yet, and I'll talk about that soon. Um, so yeah, nothing will actually show up, but there will be a sprite there, which is interesting. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> the infamous purple Koopa. That typically means something went wrong, which is fantastic. What did we do wrong? I'm no longer offended. <laughs> I'm gonna grab a cough drop real quick. Still got that cough. Okay, <clears throat> we're trying to make a very basic sprite. It loaded in the infamous purple Koopa. And what that typically means is it didn't actually invoke your code, but we can double check that. Again, what we can do is we can do things like LDA 02 star 19. Just for debugging purposes, when this sprite is loaded, this should be executed. And if it is, then we know that our code was injected correctly. Up, oh, whoopsies. Ah, there we go. Okay, so this goes back to what I was just talking about before. The act like by default was zero, the type by default was zero. If the type is zero, and I hit run, all sprites applied successfully. Even though the code isn't actually correct. <laughs> because the code was never actually read and executed through Pixie. Now, if you set the type to one, now it actually tells us that we have an issue in the code. Type of zero actually doesn't work. Unless I do something else, maybe? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. This took me a really long time to figure out one day. Okay. And I usually do stuff like this. Init routine. And then I come down here and I kind of break things up and say, main routine. So it looks like... Pixie wants an init main with all caps. Let's try that real quick. Otherwise, I'll just have to open up another 
uh, sprite for reference and we'll have to figure out exactly what they want. Yeah. I think there's a different syntax that it wants and that's okay. We'll figure it out real, real quickly here. Not the JSON file. The JSON file. Here it is. So this is what it wants. It wants this print. Print init PC, print main PC. And this is just a pixie thing. There. You touch me, you die. <laughs> yep, indeed. <laughs> and we could edit all those, all of those little ways, but yeah. Label sprite entry zero return redefined. Okay, okay, hold on. Ah, yes, yes, yes. So what we want is we do want that init here and we do want that main here. So this triggers Pixie to tell where to um, where to send your code every frame, and then obviously once when the sprite is loaded. But if we want to be able to use common labels, and I say that by saying dot. So anytime I say uh, you know, dot uh, kill Mario, that is like a sub location inside of a routine and that only exists inside of that label. You can only access it through there. Now, you could do some kind of hackery and kind of jump around if you wanted to, <clears throat> but as long as I got this label defined, I should be able to use this dot return here, this dot return here, more, more, more dot returns because they live inside these different, uh, these different labels. So let's try that. All sprites applied successfully. <laughs> they didn't apply before because I was redefining this dot return because I didn't have these uh, parent labels above. That's the reason why. Okay, let's try that. Let's see where we're at. I have a cape and I don't have a purple Koopa anymore. But we can still kill it with a cape. <laughs> so this is this is very good. We never saw like the infamous purple Koopa being loaded, and we know that the code here that gets uh, that gets executed once when the sprite is loaded gave me a cape. So now we have a sprite that is correctly loaded into the game. It doesn't do anything yet. It doesn't do anything at all. But this is like the main boilerplate, you could say, base code of a sprite. If you have any questions on that, please feel free to toss them in. Now, what does the Thea do? Maybe the Thea first looks like something. So why don't we talk about graphics routines? And also the, what is called the main sprite wrapper. I won't pretend to know everything about this, but it does something with the memory banks. I have one question. How the fuck? <laughs> Bean? Good question, RZ. Good question. The answer is... Pet the bean. Okay. Let's talk about the main sprite wrapper. And I have to open up a sprite for reference because I don't have this memorized. Something that I wrote. Door, maybe? Here it is. The main sprite wrapper almost always looks like this. So in your main routine, it's always going to look like that. Always. And again, I'm not going to really fully no being cry. <laughs> oh, sad. Do we not have no being cry? No way. Shit, we don't. 
All right, all right, we gotta fix that. We gotta fix that. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Uh, where am I going? BTTV. There, all done. <laughs> I'm offended again. There you go. We're all good. We're all good. I am no longer offended. <laughs> all right. So, this sprite wrapper, not going to pretend to know everything about how this works. It does something with the memory banks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so, what we're going to do is we're going to JSR to sprite main. So, really, what we're going to say is sprite main dot return RTS. RTS. All the code that we write here is going to be JSR and RTS, not JSL and RTL. Means are the best sprite, hands down. That's right. Baba knows what's up. Can I get a disco bean in chat? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I do remember that, Baba. <laughs> And I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> cute. Very cute. All right. We still looking good? I think we're still looking good. All right, here we go. So, main sprite wrapper. It looks like this. And this is basically just how every sprite I've ever seen, including the ones that I've written, look. You have a main function, you've got a sprite wrapper, which then uh, jumps into subroutine, JSR, into your new sprite main, which is down here. This is where we write all the custom code for our sprite. Main uh, routine. This is not the main routine, this is the main sprite wrapper. There it is. Okay. Now, let's talk graphics routines. Every sprite, not every sprite, just about every sprite that is written has what we call a graphics routine. And it's usually written as its own kind of separate contained uh, function or routine, you could say. Graphics routine. And it's also usually kind of at the bottom of the file. But what we're going to do is we're just going to say GFX. And we're going to do a dot return RTS. And again, that's how I start up pretty much all of my routines. They look like this. Name, label, dot return RTS. That's how I... That's how I do it anyway. <laughs> okay. There are four memory addresses that need to be set in each sprite for drawing out what they look like. Uh, let me think. They are indexed. And then we have to call a routine to actually do the drawing after telling it how many tiles we want. This, these are a little complicated, but I will walk through as best I can. Goats Frisbee's X-Ray or something. Yeah, yeah something, something like that, yeah. <laughs> so what do we want our Thea sprite to look like? Well, I do need to open up a... Actually, the door sprite would be fantastic for this. I'll just have this open over here. So this is a door sprite that I wrote. Um that allows you to, uh, it ignores the boundaries of, of you could say like exit locations on normal screens. And you can put it anywhere in the level and you can put the exit location level number an extra by one. So it's quite nice in that way. And I'm pretty sure the graphic is gonna be 
Nice and easy, it sure is. Okay, so. <laughs> a raging ball of death. Or a door. A door is good too. We'll draw something, Thea. We'll draw something. It'll be really bad. <laughs> My mom always told me I make a better door than a window. That is a very, very sweet sentiment, Thea. That is a very sweet sentiment. <laughs> okay. So, there is a macro. You could call it a shared routine, shared function. In Pixie itself, that uh, the, the creators of Pixie give you, which is very, very lovely, called Get Draw Info. And in VS Code, you can hit Control P and type in Get Draw Info. And you could actually look at the code itself here. And it actually, it, it doesn't always tell you. It should, in my opinion, but it tells you the output. So why your Y register gets changed to the index of the sprite OAM. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, memory address 00 gets the sprite X position relative to the screen border. And 01 gets the sprite Y position relative to the screen border. This is where you actually draw your graphics based on uh, based on the borders of the screen. Put it that way. And Y is um, it's used as an index. And I'll I'll show the opcodes again to to kind of show how this works. Okay. So the grab so what we're gonna do here is whoopsies. Okay, aunt, the chicks <laughs> one hundred two trailer park girls go round the outside, round the outside, round the outside chicka bean. <laughs> Thank you, Thea, for the hundred bits and for those wonderful, wonderful lyrics. <laughs> round the outside chicka bean. <laughs> Alrighty then. <laughs> I'm just going to say, uh, call our graphics routine. We're just going to JSR into GFX. And that's it. So that just ends up calling down to here. We have a red dot return with an RTS. Should we be, should we, should we be fine? All right. So first of all, we get our draw information, which changes uh, memory addresses 0, 1, and our Y register with information that we need to actually draw our stuff. Okay. So, in a lot of sprites, they have more than a natural lyricist. Indeed, they have more than one tile. But we're going to keep things very simple here. We're only going to draw one tile. And that is that. Okay. So. The first tile here, it starts with X position. And by position, it's really meaning... Nope. I'm gonna, I was going to say offset, but it actually is the position. So what we're going to do is we're going to LDA00. Zero, zero, because remember, 00, zero was the output of getDrawInfo for the X position. FYI, we're going to open up the memory map just a smidge. We're going to talk about the first 16 bytes in the memory map. You go away, RAM... You go away. Just right here. The first 16 bytes that we have available to is actually Scratch RAM. And it's used by basically everything. <laughs> but what that means is you are free you are free to use uh, 00 to 0 F as much as you want. However, you cannot expect them to retain their value from one frame to the next, or even from one position in your code, doing stuff down to here, because that doing stuff could also be altering and using these values as well. For example, actually a great example is, if I wanted to store a value here into zero, zero, and then I wanted to use that value down here, well, this get draw info actually overwrites that value. So you can't do that, and you kind of have to keep those things in mind. So, 
GetDrawInfo stores some scratch RAM with information in 00, 01, and our Y register. So we're going to use all of those pieces. First, we're going to load in our exposition. We're not going to do anything with this exposition, like for example, adding offsets if we were going to draw more than one tile. But no, what we're going to do is we're just going to store that A into 0300 Y. Y is our graphics index, which also uh, gets set by the get draw info. Moving on, we're going to do Y position now, which is under 01. We're going to store that into 0301, also with Y. Okay, we're going to LDA. Okay, so 302 is our actual tile, and then 303 is our properties, and I will talk about these as well. So we don't have that information right now, but we're gonna get it. So first of all, we need to define a tile. What tile do we want to use? Um, let's just call it a graphic whatever graphic tile number equals tilde sharp or pound sharp and then we'll put in an actual value here but what we're going to do is we're going to do the export thing bop, 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 bop. and now all of our graphics are now here as well as our x graphics location so what's a sprite let's see uh, 26 maybe Those are sprites, right? Maybe? Peach? Is Peach a sprite? Oh yeah, Baby Yoshi right here. Cool. Well, I usually do that one because it's just a little bit brighter and easier to see. And I'm going to go ahead and save as EXGFX. I'm not going to go over like the intricate details of graphics. EXGFX 0. Always say no. But we're just going to draw something. We're just going to draw something fun. Okay, we're just gonna delete everything. Up. Go back to 16 by 16. We just need like a single, um, a single drawn thing. What does our Thea look like? Maybe it'll be a smiley face. How about that? Maybe it'll be a smiley face. <laughs> we're gonna take our, our palette down here. We're gonna like go uh, like this. <laughs> trash that's my true form <laughs> a ball of trash <laughs> we're gonna give her eyes we're gonna go like this <laughs> that looks just like Thea doesn't it <laughs> make it a cyclops <laughs> I think this looks just like the, it's like spot on. It's perfect. We should probably color in the background, huh? Let's do something like over here. <laughs> ah, I was hearing noises. My cat is eating some stuff over there. All sides are your good side, Thea. What are you talking about? <laughs> EXGFX zero, we're gonna save, always say no. All right, there's our Thea. <laughs> Bye, Pride Peanut, I love it. Yeah, that's actually true, you totally are. <laughs> and the colors are gonna change like crazy once I put them into here, because the palettes are gonna be different. But it's just important that you use different uh, different color indexes so that you can change different things when you get it over to Lunar Magic. Okay, so EXGFX 0 is now a thing. We just saved it. Let's go ahead and close this. Yada, 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 yada. Uh, go ahead and insert. It will bypass. 
Uh, let's put it under SP3 maybe, or maybe SP4. Let's do SP4. We'll change this to... Oh, you can't use zero. I'm sorry. We just have to change the number to something else. We'll do 80. EXGFX 80. That's fine. That was a silly mistake. Uh, what am I doing? I guess I'm going to want EXGFX. EXGFX 80. There. That's like the first slot I think you can use. Reload. We will change this to 80. There we go. And now we should have our Theographic in our 8x8 editor. So if we go down, 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 down. Let's see. There she is. <laughs> Yo, Flame Bee. Welcome in. Welcome in. And Shawnee. Oh, 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 let me get caught up here. Shawnee, do you allow imager links? I think so. I'm not sure. You can give it a try. <laughs> you can give it a try. <laughs> nope. <laughs> get wrecked, Ronnie. <laughs> here, here. Hold on, hold on. There you go. And just so that I don't forget. There. Both of you guys have vips. Everyone's got vips. Vips for the friendos. <laughs> Yo, Flame B. Welcome in. I haven't seen a good flame stream in a while. <laughs> I was gonna say. I miss the rotten tomato. <laughs> Had to reload the stream. <laughs> There. Yeah, feel free to do whatever you want, Shawnee. You've got VIP, so you can do whatever. All right. So. Trying to remember, like, how all this stuff works. But it is the first tile in SP4. And if I highlight my cursor over this top left tile here, you can see that it's in location 80. See that, that tile number, it says 580. Five is actually the page. But the 80 is the location that we need. So we're going to go into here and we're gonna set this to 80. And we also need to do one more thing, which is the graphic tile properties. And these are actually really cool. Oopsies but I'll, I'll walk you through what properties are as well. Oh, let's see, what does what Shawnee got here? <laughs> Shoot. Bean. <laughs> what do you put there if the sprite takes up two tiles? First of all, Newgasm, welcome in, good to see you. Um, what you need is a loop, Newgasm. And instead of a instead of a tile number, you're gonna have a tile table. <laughs> and so what you're gonna define down here is if you have two different tiles is like tile set, and then you'll define um, things like 80, 82, 84, and then that list kind of goes on, and you have to loop through and draw each one of those. If we have time, I might be able to do that today. But for now, I'm only gonna do things that are like really simple. Like it like first sprites, make it make it easy. But what you would have to do is um, you would have to call this code here, but then wrap it in a loop. Yeah, you'd have to wrap it in a loop and count down how many tiles that you want. And I've got lots of sample code for that kind of stuff. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, there's not a lot of ASM tutorials out there. And I know this one's going to be pretty long when I upload this to YouTube, but um, I hope it'll be informative for a lot of people. Yeah. Without stable housing, I haven't been able to stream much. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Still hoping something will fall into place, but it's slow. Yeah, I hope so too, Flame B. Yeah, I hope I hope you were able to to find some place that you can call home. That's for sure. 
Can I just take a moment to shout out to Chester for sharing all of his knowledge with me? Chester, yeah. Yeah, shout outs to Chester. Like, this microphone and all of its settings, it was all Chester. <laughs> we humped on a call one day and he just was like, um, set this here, set this here, set this here, and I, I didn't know what he was doing, but it, it made it sound pretty good, so. <laughs> Props to him. Also, welcome in, Joe. I hope you're doing well. I hope you and Ray Ray are having a, having a good weekend. Okay, let us continue. So, pretty simple graphics routine so far. We get, we get our dry info, which gives us our X and Y offsets and our Y index. We just use it to index all of our values, no big deal. Okay, let us continue. Now that we've got our tile, we can store that into 302. So we're going to LDA. Da, 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 da. Graphic number, graphic tile number. We're going to store that into uh, 302. Again, indexed by Y. There we go. And the properties. The properties are really fun. Chester is actually the worst. Ooh, tacos. You're on thin ice, my friend. The most genuinely good people I've ever met? Yes, Shawnee. 100%. <laughs> also, good to see you, Tacos. Good to see you. All right. Properties. Let's talk properties. I have another link. <laughs> Where are you? Where are you? Da -da 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 -da. Here it is. The XYPPCCCT format. It's not as complicated as it sounds. But what you want to do is you want to look at this. I'll just drop the link here because why not? Thanks for putting on this clinic. Hey, thanks. Thank you for, for recognizing. And I hope it'll be, uh, I don't know. I, I hope it'll be helpful. I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, it's one byte. Here's the format for the bits you need to set. <laughs> And since, um, since we don't really need to do anything as far as, like, manipulating the bits themselves, all you really want to do is kind of go through this format, write it down on a piece of paper, and then shove it into Windows Calculator, and I'll show you that real, really quick here. So, first of all, the first two bits are X-Flip and Y-Flip. We're going to set both of these to zero. I'm actually just going to open up, what can I open up? Search? Zero, zero. Okay, so here's going to be my data. So we don't want to flip X or Y, right? So we're just going to put in zero, zero for there. Next is priority. What priority means is, does the sprite go in front of other sprites? And I also think it's going to be in front of other uh, map 16 tiles. What people usually put here is 1-1, one, one, and that just makes the sprite go in front of everything. Okay, so we've got three bytes for the next one, which is our CCC, and that is, stands for our palette. So if you put in 1-1-1 one, one, one here, that would be palette F for the sprite. If you put in 0-0-0 zero, zero, zero here, that would be palette 8, which is the one that Mario uses. So what we can do to keep things easy is probably just use palette F because not many other things use that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go 111 and that's going to go palette F. Now finally, which page do we use is T. 8 bit 8 of the tile number. It's it's kind of which page, I'm pretty sure. Yep, here it is. The one for the team means that the tile is on the second graphics page, whereas zero would be the first graphics page. And if I remember correctly, that translates pretty well to whether you use SP3 or SP4. So what we're going to do is we are going to set that to one because we're using SP4. Right there. So that right there is going to be our sprite properties value. And what we're going to do is we're going to open this up in calculator. 
We're going to go to programmer mode. We're going to click binary and paste it. And what does that tell us for the hex value? 3F. Uh, Windows Calculator is a pretty wonderful tool, by the way, for dealing with hex editing and whatnot. So 3F is now our sprite properties value. Any questions on that? Type them in. Okay, so let's go here. LDA, graphic tile properties. We're going to store that into location 303. Again, index it by Y. Increment the OM index. Some of these things you might just want to just do. <laughs> Then there's a second tile here, which we don't need to worry about. So here's the ending code for the graphics. This is going to be our entire graphics routine. This is it. So the ending code for the graphics, set that the tiles are 16 by 16. So we're going to load Y a value of 2. And then that we set that we drew one tile. We're going to load in 1 into A, and then finally call a routine in the code. And if we wanted to, we can go ahead and we can jump out to take a look and see what that is. There we go. So if we open up our best friend in the world, the memory map, where are you? Right here. The ROM map, you type in the address. And here it is. This is a sprite subroutine, the finish the OM right caller routine. So you need to call this whenever you want to actually draw some stuff out. So. Do not use outside of regular sprites. I don't know. I always use this thing. <laughs> so that's how that works, I guess. <laughs> uh, finish OM write for graphics. Okay. So why don't we go ahead and give this a shot and see if something drew on the screen. We have a graphics routine. It's very simple. Again, there's basically four values we set. X offset, Y offset, the tile number, and then the properties, which is in that form that, that we went through and built up those little bits. And then this routine just gets called from the sprite routine. And that's that. So let's go ahead and give this a shot. I hit run, all sprites applied successfully. Let's see if we didn't... Oh my god. <laughs> so sometimes things can go crazy if you're using save states. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Especially when you're updating graphics and whatnot. <gasps> What's that? Is that our Thea? Look at that cute little Thea. <laughs> so now we have a sprite. It doesn't do anything. But we have a graphics routine. It draws that little silly little circle that um, that we drew out in YYCHR. That graphics routine is getting called every single frame. We have no sprite interaction apparently. <laughs> Pet the Thea. <laughs> oh, we need to make this little guy an emote now, don't we? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> This music is a frickin' bop. It needs a bow tie and a mustache ratio and a mustache. <laughs> okay. All right. So we don't have like any interaction and stuff, but what we could do is we could start making the sprite actually do something that's interesting, like maybe move, maybe bounce around, stuff like that. Because most sprites do that. Also, we could... Let me think. We could double check the configuration values. And we could just make this sprite use default Mario interaction. Actually, I don't want to do that. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, because I think I want to turn this sprite into a boss sprite if we have time. But anyway, open up the config editor. 
Go ahead and open the file of your JSON file. Okay. So, what you can do... We, we want to keep pretty much this object in sprite clipping. The, just keep them set to zero. Because this pretty much defines... Uh, if you can look at the, the visualization here, it's not perfect. Blech. But what... Uh, <laughs> what clipping routine in Vanilla SMW is perfect? Like, am I right? <laughs> Hold on, we gotta we gotta get some music going. Okie dokie. All right, let's keep going. What we want, first of all, is to allow Mario to interact with it. So, like, right now, um, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't jump around. It doesn't move. That we can all do, but we still can't interact with it. We're going to go ahead and try just setting can be jumped on. Uh, which means that you can jump on it. I think it you can set that it'll die when it jumps on. You can say disappear in a cloud of smoke. And I believe you can spin jump on it as well. Yeah, I think we can start with this. There's See this down here? Don't use default interaction with Mario. We're going to use this later. Later. But for now, we're just going to go ahead and save this config editor. And if we wanted to open up Theo.json, all that really did was it set some of these values from false to true. So you can edit it right in the JSON file as well. That's fine too. <clears throat> okay, so why don't we go ahead and try this. But I'm pretty sure it's still not going to do it, and I'll go over why. At least I'm pretty sure anyway. Okay. So we still don't have any Mario interaction, and even though we set those values to say, here's kind of how the interaction works, um, is that too loud? That's, that might be kind of fucking loud. I'll turn it down a bit. Um, we set the interaction properties, but we didn't actually call Mario detect interaction with this sprite subroutine. That's the only thing that we're missing. So one thing I typically do, well, not required, but typically is I actually just create a new function because we're going to be doing some custom stuff later. So I'm just going to call this Mario Interaction Routine. Mario Interactions. And then, of course, like always, dot return RTS. So first, our sprite main is going to call our graphics, and then maybe we can interact with Mario. And what we do, again, is just JSR into Mario Interactions. And again, this is just a way to, like, separate out your code into different routines. It kind of just helps keep things a little cleaner, you know? So for now, we're actually only going to do one thing. And that is to just call a routine that already exists out in the memory map. And hopefully we can find it. Interaction, maybe? Mario Physics routine that does the actual calculations for cape interaction. That's not the one. Door interaction routine. S load slope information. Sprite physics routine. We're going to be using this later once we want uh, to get our sprites to actually move. Here's uh, the sprite interacting with objects routine. So if we want like the sprite to have gravity and for it to like stand on stuff, we're probably going to need to call this. Sprite buoyancy routine. Subroutine that handles interaction between Mario and the sprite sought currently at X. 
Fun thing about Pixie is that when your when your code is being called every single frame into the main method, X will be set to your sprite index every time. It's very nice. So you don't need to worry about that a whole lot unless you're starting to manipulate it. If the don't use default interaction tweaker bit is set, I'm sorry, is not set, the routine for contact will handle default interaction. Like it, it'll allow Mario to like jump on the sprite, jump off if you're holding run, I'm sorry, holding jump. Um, I believe you can spin jump and crush the enemy by default. But anyway, all we're going to do is we're going to uh, JSL into this routine and we're going to see how, see how this interacts. And again, what we could do is we could make a variable because it just helps keep the code clean. <laughs> routine address um, Mario Sprite interactions. And it's always good to kind of keep um, constant variables up here. Because if somebody were to read this code, and I just say JSL into this random ass location in the ROM, what does that mean? We have no idea what that means. And that's where these little things come in. It helps keep your code very nice and readable. That's kind of how I do things anyway. Go ahead and run. Let's go ahead and take a peek. Okay. So, can we interact? Hey! Thea killed us. Alright. <laughs> so it's kind of nice. Um, bop. That. <laughs> Let's fucking go! It's kind of nice that um, you can just call a routine. And by default, there's default interactions. And if that's the only thing that you want for your sprite, it makes it very easy, because all you have to do is just one line JSL into that routine, and you're done. It's very cool. It's very nice. I'm not going to worry about a whole lot else with that. Dies when jumped on. Hop in kick shells. I don't remember what that does. Here we go. Fall straight down when killed. Maybe we can just have it fall down. Hmm. <laughs> I guess we could just try that. See what, see what that does. <laughs> just our curiosity. Would it be like the blue uh, yellow Koopa? Yeah, exactly. So the default, the default interaction. If you don't check this, and then check these types of things, um, it'll be basically like a naked Koopa. Yeah. But if you don't check these things, um, it's going to kill you like a spiny, but it will allow you to spin jump on it and kind of bounce off. At least I'm pretty sure it will. I'm pretty sure it will. So we're going to do this. We'll go ahead and save. We'll reinsert. And then go ahead and load up. Bop. Yeah, it did sound the same thing. But yeah. Are you still making it so that you have power-ups? Have a power-up as soon as you enter the level? Uh, we completed that section, well run. Um, that'll be part of the VOD. I can I can add that code back in, but no. Uh, as of right now, that code is not being executed. This is priceless. Thanks for doing this. Hey, no problem. <laughs> yeah, a number of people asked for something like this. So I thought, uh, I don't know. I guess I guess I just thought it would be helpful. <laughs> but yeah, when I was first starting out, I asked for something like this and it, it didn't exist. So it was, um, it was tough. It was tough to get started. That's for sure. Okay. Let us... I must have been lurking and twerking too hard. I missed that. <laughs> what am I working on now? So what we're working on now is um, we've moved from... <laughs> oh my goodness. We've moved from Uber ASM, which is what uh, starting out with a mushroom, uh, that's what would run that type of code. 
and we've moved into sprites. So now we're making a custom sprite, which we're calling the Thea sprite. <laughs> because Thea in chat said, we're going to make me, duh. And then we drew a little smiley face, and now that's our new sprite, is a little smiley face. <laughs> so we're building a, spite, uh, a sprite from scratch. Um, so we built all this stuff. So far, it's, it's really, really minimal. And we have a graphics routine. We've got a little, a little smiley face that gets drawn out. It interacts with Mario, which is great. Um, what does it need to do now? It needs to do, like, movement. It needs to move. It needs to jump around. So why don't we kind of explain how that works? We can bring out our, our good friends, the cement blocks. Everyone loves a good cement block. Oh, oh shit. There we go. All right, cement blocks. Cement blocks. All right. And a good bean, I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> a good bean, just for good measure. We gotta toss in a bean, right? <laughs> I mean, why not? <laughs> okay. So. First things first. We're going to be using... When, when, when going through the rest of this code, we're going to be using some free RAM um, to help store information about our sprite. Things like what direction are we moving? Um... If we have like different states of the sprite, we want to store those states somewhere. And all of that data can be stored in this thing called a sprite table. Um, sprites in SMW have a number of different addresses that you can just use as data. And it's wonderful because when doing other types of code like UberSM or SR, not SR, UberSM, um, you have to find uh, free RAM that's not being used by anything else. But with sprites, you have sprite tables, and they're basically used any way you want them to. Like, for example, here, here's 1504, it's 12 bytes. Why 12 bytes? Because in vanilla SMW and anything that isn't SA1, you have 12 sprites that can be loaded in on the screen or in the game at all times. Period. It's 12 sprites. And so all of these sprite tables are going to be 12 bytes in length. One for each, uh, one for each sprite. So, let's take a look at this one real quick. YouTube. Thank you. Let's take a look at this real quick. So, mis miscellaneous sprite table. In the original game, it's used... Uh, it's only used in the revolving brown platform and nowhere else. More information can be found here. A number of these sprite tables are kind of like that, where certain sprites use different tables, but really, again, it's just free RAM for sprites. Each sprite has one byte each that they can use. And you can use any number of these sprite tables. There's a lot of them. However, one thing to note is that one sprite table does not always act like other sprite tables. Let's take a look at these real fast. So these three right here. This table decrements itself once per frame. This table decrements itself once per frame. Same thing down here. So if you were to use these sprite tables to, um, to store data that you just need to recall later, it's going to start decrementing every single frame until it reaches zero. Uh, timers are fantastic, by the way. I use them in just about every single sprite. But you just need to be aware that your data is going to be lost over time. However, most tables... Um, don't. But, uh, a lot of these tables are used for specific things. 
mostly used for particular things, you could say. Like, for example, 15.7c, it's most often used. It doesn't have to be. You can use it for anything you want. But it's most often used for horizontal sprite direction. And then when you are going to call your graphics routine, it grabs this value, uses that in the sprite properties, those little bits that we were uh, building up, and then it will flip the uh, graphics around if you're going either left or right. So that's kind of how that works. It uses the sprite properties uh, so that you only need one version of the graphic instead of two, like a left and a right version. I'm so smart. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. <Thea. laughs> okay. So again, all the sprite tables can be used for anything you want. At all. But some of them auto-decrement, so you have to be aware of that. And other things are simply just used mostly for specific purposes. All right. So we can just pick them if we want to, and that's totally fine. So why don't we just go ahead and pick uh, direction. So it's 15.7c. And I'm going to create a nice little uh, constant up here. Before I forget, I'm actually going to take a snapshot. We're going to call it uh, graphics done moving on to movement. Got a snapshot of my code and my ROM. Again, that's the magical, the magical world of version control of GitHub. Okay, so this is uh, constant addresses. And this is going to be like uh, constant values. And then down here we can say um, sprite table, sprite tables sprite tables, and we can say uh, sprite table, and this is going to be specific for, oh shit! <laughs> Yo, Tacos, thank you so much for the Prime sub. I hope you enjoy those beans. Thanks a lot, bud, I really appreciate that. So we're going to say sprite table uh, direction. So we're going to be using this sprite table specifically to to keep uh, which direction the sprite is moving. So that's why we're going to call it the direction. Oh. Now remember, <laughs> this is actually really important because I've made this mistake a thousand fucking times. And we're going to be talking about indexing in just a moment. So let's go back to here. This is 15.7c. That is the location that begins the table, right? The table. I'm going to open up paint. <laughs> Me. Bop. 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 Remember when we drew out a picture of the memory? Like the big memory chunks? Pretend that there's 12 here. <laughs> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Pretend there's 12. Pretend there's 12. Um, so at the very start, right here, is address space 15, 7, C. There are 12... <laughs> I kind of just want to draw out a few more. <laughs> God damn it. 9, 10, 11, 12. Cool. 12. There are 12 uh, sprites. 12 sprites in the game at any one time. Whether that's on the screen or processing off screen. 12 sprites in the game. That doesn't mean 12 tiles, that just means 12 sprites. Okay. So, if my sprite has a sprite index of zero, then what I want is that location. If my sprite has a sprite index of 02, what I want is this location because other sprites are going to be using this guy this guy this guy and so on and so forth this is an array in other programming languages so again x our x register unless 
we modify it. X register equals sprite index. Cool. So what we want to do is whenever accessing a sprite table by saying 157C, if we forget, <laughs> if we forget to put in a comma X, it will always go right here to the first spot, which is almost never going to be the right location <laughs> and will fuck up other sprites that are actually using that location. <laughs> So instead, we're going to be offsetting 157C by X. And so that way, our sprite index is going to be, uh, is going to read this value offset by whatever index we have, and it's going to go to the right location. And this is how all sprite tables work. It's how all offsetting works in memory addressing. Cool beans. Beans? All right. <laughs> cool. TLDR, we're just adding a value to a memory address. That's it. Whether that value is between 0 and 11, 0 and 12. Yeah. <laughs> Hokey dokey. So that's how sprite tables work. They're arrays. You got to make sure that you index the proper location. Okay. So we defined the table up here. Now, whenever we use something that starts with sprite table, and this is why it's very important to make uh, constants, because I will always forget to put a comma X, like right here whenever I'm using this, because I don't remember that this is a sprite table. <laughs> But yeah, anytime we see this as part of the constant, that's what should trigger our brain to actually put the comma X in front. Okay, that lecture. That lecture can be wrapped up. So Mario Interactions doesn't go here. So maybe, maybe when the sprite loads, we want it to face Mario, right? But only when the sprite loads. So maybe we should put that in the init routine. And there's usually not a lot of code in the init routine, and that's why I um, I tend to not break out the init routine as much as the main routine. So, similar to the uh, get draw info method, there's another method called subhors pause. And here it is right here. Routine that spawns a normal, wait, no it doesn't. <laughs> no it doesn't. <laughs> uh, okay, I, no, that's, that's not what this does. <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> this is kind of embarrassing. This is not accurate at all. What this does is it actually just outputs one, <laughs> Thank you, Fry. <laughs> Zero if Mario is on the right side of the sprite. One if Mario is on the left side of the sprite. And then, oh yeah, probably a 16-bit difference. Yeah, for sure. It does not. It does not spawn sprites. <laughs> I can't believe they have that in here. But anyway, this is what um, this is what all sprites use to determine how to spawn, like how to actually start the direction in which you're moving. Okie dokie. So first of all, what we're going to do... Okay, so it's Y. It, it sets your Y register to either 0 or 1. And then the difference, we're not going to use this, so I'm not going to be worried about this output here. <laughs> Son of a whore's pause. Okay, so let's go ahead and call it. There's also a subvert pause as well, but that's uh, not used as much, I don't think. Different types of sprites, I suppose. So we're gonna call a subhorse pause. And then what we're really gonna do is we're just gonna move Y register into here. And that's it, because remember the subhorse pause, the output of that 
is a 0 or 1 in the Y register. So we can open up our opcodes real quick. How do we store Y? There's a couple different ways, actually. One thing you can do... Oh, it's not in here. TSP. Oh, right here, transfer registers. So here's one way to do it. Is you could say, transfer Y to A. So what you can do is you could just say TYA, which then just copies your Y value into your A register, and then you can store that A anywhere you want to. And there's, you know, a bunch of different ways you can do this. You can do TA for transfer A to Y, TAX for transfer A to X, um, or there's also actually shorthand, which is store Y. So what we can do here is we can just say store Y into a memory location. Now, sometimes, and I think I actually just found it. I was going to say, sometimes these don't allow for paging. Look at, look at store Z. It actually allows for an absolute indexed with an X. Store Y doesn't. This is direct page instead of absolute indexed. And uh, store X doesn't either. So we can try this. But I bet we're probably going to just have to transfer it to A and then store A. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. So our value is in Y. Why don't we just say STY, we're going to store Y into sprite table direction. And remember, X. We need to, we need to address our sprite tables. Let's see if this works. And if not, we know what to do. Nope. So this is an unknown command. So if this were A, you could just do this type of uh, indexing right away. But since it's the Y, there's no instruction that allows you to do that. So all we have to do is we have to transfer Y to A and then store A. That's all. There we go. All sprites successfully. So right now what we have is a direction. And when the sprite loads, it's based on Mario's position, whether the sprite is moving left or moving right. Cool. So maybe we could have a sprite speed variable. Uh, graphic, we could just say... Um, that was called speed. Speed equals and like moving speed or something. Moving speed. And we'll just say like 10? I don't know. Something like that. Okay. So what we need to do now is what if we uh, used our direction to actually move our sprite left or right. And then we, we need to interact with walls to determine if we need to like flip our, um, our sprite around to start walking the other way. It's not too bad. So again, same as same as before, what we're gonna do is we're actually just gonna create a new routine and just kind of put our code in there. So we can say handle um, sprite movement and physics. Something like that. JSR sprite movement. Same thing. We're gonna say sprite movement dot return. RTS, same as always. Put a little comment and we'll say Sprite, Sprite Movement Routine. Round two, Nugget, you're so sorry. Thank you, Thea. Thank you supporting your, your local neighborhood bucket. <laughs> okay, so after a good amount of code, we we'll just go ahead and run this. Looks like nothing broke, so I think we're I think we're still good to go. All right. So, sprite movement. The way this silly stuff works is you set your sprite speed, which is actually another sprite table. Um, so you set your sprite speed, and then you call a physics routine which then automatically updates your sprites X and Y values based on your speed. Uh, the X and Y values are also another sprite table, <laughs> which you can modify yourself if you want to. 
um, but you don't have to. In fact, it's it's super nice to just call the graphics, not graphics, physics routines and have it automatically update all these things based on your speed. And that way your sprite um, kind of has like the same fall speed. It interacts with different things the same as all the other sprites in the game. And of course, you can write your own physics routines if you want to, like right in here, but you don't have to do that. So, call. Uh, I could say like, update our uh, sprite speed. And then we're gonna call physics routine. And then maybe down here, what we can do is check if uh, we bonked a left wall, check if we bonked a right wall. Yeah. And if we did, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna flip our speed over. And that's it. Okay. Update our sprite speed. So, remember how speed works? We drew that little bell curve? Yeah, I think it was a bell curve. Um, with Mario speed, it's the same thing with sprite speeds. So, what we want to do is we want to check our direction. So, we're going to say LDA, sprite table direction, and again, remember to index it with X. I also kind of sort of like to make constant values. Um, direction left equals zero. This is a little unnecessary, but I kind of like doing it. Direction right equals a one, something like that. But I do want this to match whatever um, sub horse pause actually returns. So zero is moving right, one is Mara moving left. I'm gonna say that. Cool, direction right, direction left. So if I LDA the sprite table direction, and we're gonna CMP against, uh, just pick one, uh, direction left, then what we're going to do is we're going to branch to movement uh, left. And then right here, we're going to be moving right. So dot movement left. And then we're going to have a dot after movement. This is, a, this is kind of a common way for me to kind of write if else statements in assembly. And it's you know, again, it's probably not the most efficient way to do things. But it works for me. Meh. Like, I really love the Final Fantasy XIII soundtrack, but sometimes there's some weird-ass shit there. Okay. So first of all... Well, not first of all. Let's just continue doing this. Okay, so if we're moving right, all we have to do is load in um, our speed and then set that to the sprite table of speed. That's that's it. All those memory tricks. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of things to remember and to like just try not to fuck up. <laughs> sprite table x speed equals, and let's just go ahead and look that up. Where are you? Right here. So it's in here somewhere. X speed. And if I set this to 12, that should um, make sure that I grab a sprite table. And there it is. So it's B6, sprite X speed table. And it actually tells you which... Uh, um, block interaction, speed, gravity. So we're going to actually call this guy right down here as well. YouTube, I am abstract. Welcome in, by the way. But yes, I am making this um, after many people uh, asked me to do this. And um, I'm going to be posting this to YouTube. Yeah. 
only slightly edited. <laughs> so it's going to be a pretty damn long video. We're already on three hours and ten minutes. <laughs> it's going to be pretty heavy. Okay, so I'm actually going to copy this because this is our physics routine. And I'm going to store that for later. Right here. Routine address uh, sprite physics. Oh. So we're, we're going to need to call that real soon. Okay. So what we were doing was we were going to be updating our speed and then calling the physics routine that will automatically update our position. So sprite table x speed is in B6. Very cool. So sprite movement is our little routine here that we're calling for sprite movement. And if we're moving right, all we're going to do is we're going to LDA speed. That's a constant value, so, so no indexing. And we're going to store that into sprite table x speed x. <laughs> Remember, we have to index by x because this is a table. And I have to keep saying that because... Let me tell you, if you forget to put that there, nothing goes wrong until you start running your code and it just doesn't act like you would expect. And it's just, it's a pain to figure that out. <laughs> so we're moving right and then we're just gonna bra branch always down to after movement. And then, otherwise we're gonna move left. And again, there's definitely a more efficient way to do this. This is the easiest way to read for me. So this time, the exact same flip over trick that we did before, we're gonna LDA moving speed, we're gonna EOR against FF and increment it once. So that will be this exact same speed except it's now moving left instead of right. And then we're gonna store that into X and then we're just gonna drop down into after movement. So that should handle our movement. But our sprite's not actually going to move because we never called our physics routine yet. That's the routine that actually updates our positions based on speed. So, we have that routine. We just have to call it. And I believe it is a JSL. Address routine. Sprite physics. Now, I think... That is enough to get things moving. I think. Yep, looks like there's no errors. So let's go ahead and give that a run. Alright, let's see if this little guy moves. Look at him go! <laughs> That's how bean physics works, by the way. If you move a bean and then he touches a wall, he just goes like right into it. <laughs> Bean. So there we go. Um, we've got a sprite that moves. Um, now, what we want to do is we want to change the direction if the sprite hits a wall, right? So one quick thing to note is that... Right here. So we just called this physics routine right here. It handles X, Y speed with gravity and with block interaction. This is a big important thing. There's another one that does it all without gravity and without block interaction. So sprites like uh, bullet bills, bonsai bills, flying question blocks, those guys would end up calling this, uh, this routine because they don't want to interact with objects. Our sprite is like a living sprite. It's going to be walking on the ground. So we want it to interact with blocks. And a big part of this is this routine will actually end up setting some values, telling us whether or not it's blocked on one side or the other, which will tell us when to flip over. Kind of like how, um, how Galoombas work, for example. If they hit a wall, they just turn around and go the other way. So we're going to do that next. And what we're going to look for is blocked. 
So we, again, we're looking for length 12 because we're looking for a sprite table. We're looking for the text of blocked. And what we found was sprite blocked status table. We get to do some formatting stuff, which is really nice. But look at this down here. This tells us after a graphics routine is called and this gets updated, this tells us if the sprite is blocked on any side. And this is again based on, um, I can open this up. It's based on this clipping right here. So the math is based on this clipping value. Uh, but since we're only using a single tile, this becomes a little bit easier for us to, to use. So what we're going to do is we're going to check left, we're going to check right, and we're going to kind of flip things over if things are blocked. Okay, so first things first, we have <coughs> a new sprite table, and we're just going to copy it into a new variable up here, just so that we have it. Sprite table blocked status equals 1588. Okay, and now we can just go ahead and use this. And I'll show you kind of how to use bitwise operations to check for different things. Um, and this is what's used for like um, checking for button presses because it's only one byte for all of the buttons. Actually, it's, it's two bytes because you have a lot of buttons. Um, but you have to find a way to get at individual bits as opposed to just the entire byte as itself. And we can go through that. It's pretty simple. Check if we bonked a left wall. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to LDA the blocked status. And again, it's a sprite table. Don't forget to index by X. Okay. So let's open this up again. Bonk me. Would you like a good bonk, okay? Or, uh, Thea? <laughs> I can give you a good bonk. <laughs> Thea. <laughs> Bonk. <laughs> Look, sometimes when you're streaming, you don't have your brain on. <laughs> Bonk. All right, so here's the thing. We're going to open up paint again, and we're going to walk through this. We have eight bits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So why did I put that one there? It's because of this. So we're only going to use the bottom four bits, right? And we're going to be checking for left first. So the left is the, uh, the second to last bit. So, say if... We want to check for left and we don't care about anything else. We... <laughs> Thanks, Fry. <laughs> We're going to do a bitwise and. So we did a bitwise EOR a bit ago. We're going to do an and. And we're going to and it against one, one. Oh, actually, hold on. Zero, 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 one, zero. There. So let's kind of go through this. Bitwise and. What does the and mean? It means both bits have to be set for the output to be one. So both of these are zero. Welcome back, Thea. <laughs> both of these are zero. It's zero. Both of these are one. It's one. And so on and so forth. So the output here is going to be we and against this we check if it equals this and if it does we can branch out because it's we are bonked on the left side or we are blocked by the left side now the same thing to the right the right side is the final bit and so we just do the same thing we check on the right side and again there's probably a nice way to do both of the checks all in one this is easier <laughs> so let's go ahead and write this in code we're going to and this against, and just because I want to make this visual, we're anding it against the value that we're looking for. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
So this is the binary value we're adding against. Hex is two. Two. And for those of you who are more versed in binary, this makes sense, right? Because this right here would be one, this right here would be two, this is four, eight, and so on and so forth. In powers of twos. Eight. Nice eight. <laughs> I also meant bonk by sprite, but that worked too. <laughs> hey, sometimes Theo needs a good bonk. What can, what can you do? Why the hell is tacos not a bip anyway? Gotta fix that problem, damn. All right, here we go. Okay, so we're gonna and against O2. Remember, it's a constant value of O2, so we need that pound in there. Otherwise, if it's if it's not, you're gonna be loading in the value of whatever's in address space of O2. <laughs> Check if we bonk the left wall, and then we're going to... Let me think. <laughs> We can compare against O2, even though you don't need to do this. It just kind of makes it a little bit more clear as to what you're doing. I'm going to do it anyway. Screw it. Compare against O2, and if they equal, then we're going to say uh, bounce or um, switch to right, switch to right, switch to right. And I'll just make that, I'll just bring that down here dot switch to right. And we'll do the same thing for the right side as well. Except this time we're not going to be checking two, we're going to be checking one. And that's just because if we load up the sprite table again, the right side is in the one spot. That's all. <laughs> you need to be put in your place sometimes. Yeah, it do be like that. <laughs> okay. And then we're going to switch to left. And then if we get down here, that means we're not blocked at all. And all we have to do is just bra dot after blocked. And just bring it down here. Okay. So now we have a switch to right section. We'll make a switch to left section. This is fairly inefficient code. But it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Not worried about that too much as long as I can read it. Okay. So we want to switch to right. And at the very end of switch to right, we want to jump over the switch to left because we don't want to call that. Got after blocked. Yeah. 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 Gross. There we go. After blocked. I often will put a bra after blocked like right here because that kind of feels like it just keeps the code clean. But in all fairness, it's just going to drop down to after blocked anyway, so you don't need that. Design decision that you can make on your own. <laughs> Decipher this. Well, I can just paste that into Google if you'd like me to. <laughs> it's a question mark. <laughs> Thanks, Thea. <laughs> Decipher this, burb. <laughs> Works harder, not harder. That's right. <laughs> Keep it away because it saves three bytes of RAM, or ROM space. Yep, indeed. Bracky knows what's what. <laughs> three bytes of ROM space. What would we ever do without those? YouTube. YouTube. Are we still live? Are we still live? Are we good? Is it just YouTube that's blowing up on me? Still live? Okay, cool. Because, yeah, things like aren't loading. I wonder if there's YouTube going crazy on me. Okay, let's just, let's just pull up this again because there's less for me to worry about in that soundtrack. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure that says something lewd, Shawnee. <laughs> Thank you all for, for letting me know. Okay. Check if we bonk to left. Check if we bonk to right. So, how do we switch to right? Let's see. I think all we need to do is just 
update our direction. And then maybe what we'll want to do is we'll want to move the movement down after we check if we have uh, left or right um, blocked statuses. And that way we'll move after we hit the wall as opposed to on the next frame. If that makes sense. So really all we want to do is here, we just want to LDA um, direction right, and we're going to store that into our direction table, which is right here. And same here, switch to left, going to LDA direction left, and we're going to store that into our direction table. And then we're going to move down to after we're done checking the block status. So yeah, why don't we update our sprite speed afterwards? Right here. So the first thing we're going to do is actually we're going to call the physics routine so that we can update all of our values. And then we're going to check for block status. And then we're actually going to move our sprite. We'll give that a shot. <laughs> God damn it. Now I have to do this. <laughs> what does it say? Okay. So let me see. It's, 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 it's not ASCII. Ah, got it. <laughs> it wasn't ASCII slash UTF-8. It was ASCII. I gotcha. <laughs> Shawnee pulls out the D's nuts and binary. Very good. Very good. <laughs> All right, here we go. Right speed, moving left, moving right. Left, obviously. Okay, let's just give this a shot. Let's just give this a shot and see what happens. <laughs> okay, so it looks like we got some issues. That's okay. So line 83. Ah, I need to put a star. Silly mistake. That's okay. There we go. Okay. There we go. Let's give this a quick shot. You guys are having... Way too much fun over there with binary. <laughs> Alright, here we go. Does the guy move? Hey! Hey! <laughs> we have a Thea sprite, and she kind of bounces back and forth. And she kills us. <laughs> The guy, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> it looks like the blocked also, um, it also triggers if, uh, <laughs> if it kills Mario. There's actually one thing that almost all sprites do that we didn't do yet, and that is to handle the sprites frozen bit. Or flag, you could say. Ah. And we can do that right now. Right now. It's very quick. I think it's... It's pretty high up on the list. Here. We're going to set this back to 1. We're going to look for flag. It's pretty quick. Come on. Come on. No, no, no. There we go. Frame counter, players in air flag. Water flag, subject flag. Lock flag, 90. That's what it is, I think. Most codes will still run if this is set, but nothing will move or animate. So if you remember, we just died by Thea. <laughs> and the sprite was still moving around. The way to fix that is to check the sprites is locked flag which is 9d and then just kick out just kick out do absolutely nothing if we're locked cool so again first things first make a constant address address sprites locked flag 9d then we come down here it's usually what i do first right after <laughs> The graphics routine because we still want the sprite to draw 
but we don't want the sprite to move. So we're gonna check uh, locked status and kick out if we need to. Make the uh, sprite a virus and if you die, game crashes. I can actually do that, believe it or not. I can actually do that. I might be able to do that right now. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Because I think in the Mario Interactions routine, it does actually set something that I can check. And then it's really easy to crash the game. It's really easy to crash the game. I can show you. Checked lock spread. Us. Okay, so we need to LDA for address. Sprite's locked flag. And then if that's set to 1, I believe. That doesn't tell you if it's 0 or 1, but I'm pretty sure if it's 1 then we need to just kick out. So basically, if it's anything that's not zero, what you can say is branch if not equal. Because remember, equal and not equal read the zero flag, the Z flag. So you can just say if it doesn't equal, then you can just do dot return. So if this is zero, then we're going to interact like normal. But if it's one or anything that's not zero, then we're going to just kick out and hit return right away. We'll give that a shot. <laughs> uh, I can't believe somebody found a way to crash the frickin' switch. <laughs> That's nuts. Okay, so what we want to do is we just want to die, and then Thea freezes, like you would expect a sprite to do so, which is great. All right, so Thea wants to crash the game. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> All right, so Mario Interactions right down here. If we JSL to this Sprite Interactions, that will kill the player. Um, but it also sets a bit. I think it also sets the carry flag. So BCC is branch if the carry is clear. We can look that up right away. Why don't we open up this guy? We'll close this for now. Up it up it up it uh, branches. Branch of carry clear, branch of carry slat. So carry is just another flag that's used for a number of different purposes. Usually it's for arithmetic purposes. Like if you're adding two values and then you have to carry a value over to the next, it's called the carry flag. But you can use it for like a whole bunch of different shit. And it's set if um, you call this routine and Mario does actually interact with uh, the sprite. So if it's clear, I think I'm just going to branch to dot return. If it's set, all we have to do to break the game is get our stack out of, out of order. <laughs> bah. So all we're going to do is push A onto the top of the stack, which means that the next time somebody pulls from the stack, it's going to be something completely unexpected. And also, it's going to break everything else that wants to pull and push from the stack. <laughs> so, assuming this works, you guys will get to see what a stack error looks like. And it's awful. <laughs> it's awful. Let's take a look, shall we? Alright. Okay, well the branch didn't work. <laughs> but I could probably show you guys anyway by just removing... Actually, BCC... Let's try a BCS. Just, let's just flip it around just to see if I have the right direction right. Yeah, let's just try a BCS. Actually, no, that wouldn't have worked. Huh. That's interesting. Let me just see if I can show you. PL, I'll just put like a pull, and that'll that'll mess up my stack as well. Let's just try this and see if that works. It might break immediately. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. There it is. <laughs> there it is. 
it loads in different music. Sometimes it crashes the emulator. Sometimes it has a bunch of graphics like going crazy on the screen. <laughs> it can do a whole bunch of weird shit. But yeah, that's what that's what stack issues look like. <laughs> and by stack issues, it's really remember when we were talking about the stack being a stack of plates. And this time, every person who puts their plate onto the spring-loaded stack expects to get their plate back. And when they go back to get it and they pick the next plate up and it's not theirs, that's when things go crazy. <laughs> so the general rule of thumb is that whenever you push onto the stack, you have to remember to pull later on. That's basically the rule. For every push, there is a pull. And that way, um, your stack won't get out of won't get out of whack. Okay, so we have a sprite. It interacts with Mario. Mario can jump on it. It moves left, it moves right, and it changes direction based on block interaction. Cool beans, yeah? Pretty, pretty cool. Alright. So, because the stream is currently going on three and a half hours, um, why don't we move forward to the last segment, which is how to build the very basics of a boss fight. And I'm trying to make this about as simple as I can. Because these, for, for perspective... Dark Chambo, which is a very simple sprite compared to a lot of bosses out there, was over 6,000 lines of assembly. <laughs> so I don't want to go that heavy. Um, but a very, very obvious um, behavior for a boss fight is to get hit like three times and then die and then like set... Uh, set the player one, the level status, that type of stuff. So why don't we go ahead and do that? And that'll be like, maybe like the furthest point I want to go today. I would love to talk about like, the idea behind states and phases. But I might save that for another video because that kind of pushes things in, an, in a more complex direction. That's okay, that's okay. So let's say if Thea needs to be jumped done three times. There is a series of code <laughs> that I'm going to be copying into here. Um, if you wish to use it, take notes or reach out to me and I'll just give you anything that you want. <laughs> but first of all, bosses need to... Right here. Don't use default interaction with Mario. Just set this to true. Because now we have to code in our own interaction with Mario. And that is why I actually created this routine here. So we're going to keep this JSL. But now nothing's going to happen once we, uh, once we actually touch the sprite. Uh, Mario won't be damaged or or get killed um, because we're saying don't use default interaction with Mario. We have to code in all the things ourselves, even though this will actually tell us whether or not there's um, there's interaction. So first of all, we're going to bcc dot return branch of carry clear. What this means is the output of this routine is going to have the carry flag set or cleared based on whether or not we interact with Mario. So why don't we just do a very quick test. We can LDA 02 star into 19. And again, if, um, if you weren't here, this is like the very basic debugging of code. All you do is um, you set the Mario power-up status to something other than zero, and that visually shows you that your code is being executed. So let's go ahead and give that a try. So basically, I do expect that whenever we run into Thea, she gives us a cape. <laughs> I 
There we go. <laughs> Bop. <laughs> Got a cape, killed Thea. All right. So there is another flag that um, can disable cape, I'm pretty sure. Cape. Invincible to star cape fire bounce block. We'll just set that to true. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Thea gives capes now. That would actually be a kind of a fun Kaizo mechanic. Like a sprite that kind of moves back and forth, and if you get the cape, you're clearly screwed because of the setup of the level. That would be kind of fun. <laughs> I did not consent to be killed. Hey, you're the boss now. <laughs> it's our job as Mario to kill the boss. <laughs> Don't make me spawn a baby Yoshi and have the Yoshi eat you. <laughs> At least make it Luigi. <laughs> So we know that the routine or the routine now is actually working. <laughs> um, so now we just have to code in what do we want to happen um, if Mario, for example, jumps. Do we want to hurt Mario? Do we want to check if Mario is spin jumping? Do we want to uh, damage the boss and do that little uh, that little damage sound that all bosses have? Uh, probably the latter. So why don't we... Um, I'm going to open up some reference code, and then I'm going to walk through that as well. Because I have all this stuff done. I just have to remember how to do it. There is a trick to remember, because like... This routine here, all it does is it checks if a sprite is interacting with Mario. If we want the sprite to kill Mario, if it's on like the left or the right, but we want to do something else when Mario jumps on the sprite, we have to detect if it's on the top of the sprite. And there is a little routine to do that that I have saved in a number of different places. And I'm just going to go and grab it. I have it in Dark Chambo. It's somewhere in here. Let's see. So here's Dark Chambo. It was my first boss, and it's insane. <laughs> so this boss is 4,100 lines of code, and then it had like three or four other custom sprites that added to more, even, even more code. So let's see. I think there's like a check. Uh... Uh, Mario, there's no, there it is, Mario Interactions Routine. And then there's a skip to no contact, very similar to what we just talked about. I also had an iframe timer, throwing hat states, all these things that I'm checking to see if the, if the boss is vulnerable. There it is, check if above, this is the code that I found somewhere. I don't remember where, but I found this a while ago. Code by Runic on SMW Central. So this is Runic's code. But anyway, what this does is it checks if your Mario is actually on the top of the sprite or if it's on the bottom. Not top will again, it'll clear the carry or it will set the carry. That's the output of this function. So we're just going to copy this routine, and we're just going to paste it right here. And again, if you want it, just, I don't know, you can probably find it by Googling. Otherwise, just ping me, and I'll paste it right on over. So it's very similar to this guy. We're just going to JSR to check if above, and then we're going to um, BCC to hurt Mario. And why do we want to hurt Mario? That's because we did, if we got to this point in code, we did interact with the sprite. But we are not on top of the sprite. Which means that we need to damage the Mario. But very much down here, obviously, we don't want to fall into the, the hurt Mario, uh, you could say, subsection there. So branch always 
dot return down here. And then this code can be more stuff like, you know, bouncing Mario up and playing music and stuff like that or sound effects. So hurt Mario, hurt Mario's, uh, it's very similar to death. Open up our, let me see our map again. It's a ROM. It is a subroutine. Let's look for damage. Subroutine that will damage Yoshi. Drop item from box subroutine. Oh, looks like I don't know if I can find it from damage. Makes munchers and spikes not hurt the player. Getting hurt, basically death. <laughs> yeah, maybe I can search for hurt instead. Table, physics, hurt routine. There it is. So instead of the death routine, here's the hurt routine. So we can JSL to it, and here it is. And this um, this will take all of your, like, your power-up status into account for you. So it'll kill the player if you're small. It'll damage the player if they have a power-up. It's um, It handles all that for you, which is really nice. So again... First thing we do, we create an address. Routine. Don't we have a... Right physics lock fag. Don't we have a death address? Or did we not make one for that? Oh, that was in our other example. Never mind. Yep, um, it was in my mind. Routine address hurt Mario. Yeah, that was in our last example of the Uber ASM stuff. So what we're going to do is we're just going to move down to our, where are we? Uh, Mario Interactions, right down here. Hurt Mario. We're going to JSL to the routine address Hurt Mario, and that's it. We're just going to return, we're going to kick out. But if we are above and we did interact, we need to do some other things. So... Let's see, check if above. This is just, again, some reference code that we're gonna walk through, so, so I don't have to memorize everything. <laughs> Here. So there is a function that actually sets Mario's jump speed after they jump off of a, um, uh, off of a sprite. And there's also another thing to display the contact graphics. So we're gonna go ahead and use these right away. Routine address, um, jump Mario, and there's another one to display contact graphic. And again, we can find these out in the memory map as well. I just already had the code, so I just copied the you know the addresses from the code. Dark Chimbo. So we'll go ahead and call those right in here. So basically, if we get into this code, we did interact and we are above. So what we're going to do is we're going to JSL to, uh, of course, if I have this open, then all of these things come in. Routine address. Um, we're going to jump the Mario. And then we're going to do another line of code to display contact. And then we're going to keep track of Thea's health. And we're going to decrement it and we do all that stuff. But for now, we're going to go ahead and just run this and see if it works. Okay. All right. Look at that. Bop, 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 bop. And if we get hit on the side, we still die. So that check if above little routine that we copied over, that's what's telling the code whether or not we need to do something or hurt Mario. Okay. Now the one thing we didn't do is we didn't display, or we didn't like having like any sound effects or anything. 
So I'm going to open up. <laughs> I'm going to open up another page. And this is called the... What is this? The Sound Effects IO Ports page. I'll paste this one in chat just in case anybody wants it. But here's this. So what do we want to... Uh, make the game play as a, as a little sound effect when we bop her on the head. <laughs> it could be any one of these. There's different, these are called banks. And then there's a whole bunch of different things um, that exist inside those banks. You're absor learning and absorbing way more than you thought you would? All right. I mean, that's awesome. And thank you for the compliment. <laughs> So what bosses usually use, because I have this little variable up here. It looks like we're using uh, 1DFC as the bank. Let's look for 1DFC. Right here, 1DFC. And we're using the sound effect of 28, which is enemy stunned hurt, like charging chucks or the Koopalings. <laughs> oh God, you want to make me do a green pain? Oh, uh, what is that? Can we find that? Like springboard? Oh, right, it's right there. Eight. <laughs> We're doing it, Newgasm. We're doing it. <laughs> okay. So here's our bank for our sound effect. We're going to make some variables. <laughs> bank. I hate that I started not using all caps, and then I started using all caps. Yeah. Maybe I can transfer those real quick to so the bank, and then we need the sound effect actual number. And we're going to use, that was 08? Yeah, 08. <laughs> and I think I need that. I think it's, a, yeah, I think it's a constant value. The bank is um, an address, and the sound effect is where you're, is what you're writing into it. So let's jump back down here. I'm just going to make some comments. Bounce Mario. Uh, show contact graphic. Play music. Or no, not music. Play sound effect. So we're going to LDA uh, sound effect number and we're just going to store it into sound effect bank. And I think that'll do it. Let's give it a shot. <laughs> Otherwise, I might have to... I guess we'll see. We'll see. All right. <laughs> this is tough. <laughs> Honestly, this is actually kind of a fun sprite already. <laughs> We could totally use these in levels. <laughs> Thea's a, a bouncy, smiley blob. <laughs> Love it. Love it. All right. And so... The most basic, um, you could say, behavior in like a boss or anything else in, in a more complex sprite is to limit how many interactions go into it, right? Um, like a lot of bosses take like three hits from either bounces or throw blocks. And here, our interactions are going to be from bounces. And so what we need to do is we need to find a sprite table store our health in it, and then decrement said health. And we're going to go through that. So let's open up the memory map. Uh, we're going to go back to our good friends, the sprite tables. <laughs> there we are. So here's all of our sprite tables. Let's see, 1504, original game, moving to nothing else. So this one doesn't auto-decrement, that's important. 
And it looks like it's not being used by anything. Because we haven't used it yet. <laughs> but yeah, so we're going to go ahead and go ahead and use that. We're going to say sprite table health equals that. So that's where we are storing our health. But how much health do we want to start with is also a constant value. Uh, you just say health. And we're just going to say three. So we have three hits until we blow up or something. <laughs> Okay, so first of all, what we want to do is in init, very similar to our sprite table direction, we need to set our health when the sprite is loaded. So all we're going to do is we're going to LDA uh, health, which is just our constant value, and we're going to store it into sprite table health. And again, X, because it's a sprite table. Cool. So now... With my interactions right down here so we did all the bouncy stuff we did a sound effect we've played the contact um now what we're gonna do is we're going to decrement um i don't know if i can decrement i guess we can check the op codes we're gonna decrement our health and then we're gonna check if health is zero and if so then we're gonna do something else like make the player win or something like that but if we check our op codes and we go to deck, which is decrement, ah, it looks like we can do a decrement on an indexed uh, table, which is pretty nice. So we should be able to do deck uh, table health. All right, sprite table health x. We can just go ahead and decrement that. And then we're going to LDA the sprite table. And if it's zero, we want to basically uh, end, the, end, end the game. We're going to pretend it's a boss. <laughs> so we're going to BNE.return. What does that mean? We're going to branch if not equal. So remember, the equals, it, it, it always reads the Z flag. And the Z flag gets set if A ends up becoming zero for any particular reason. So if I LDA, if I load A, this value, and it happens to be zero, then I'm not, and it happens to be zero, then I'm not going to branch to return. If it's zero, I'm going to fall down into here. All right. So here we hit the boss and the boss's health has fallen to zero. So we can end the game or something. <laughs> or, you know, we can like kill the player on three hits. That'd be stupid. <laughs> Make Thea evil. Dot end game. And I'm just going to put a dot end game here. We're never going to call it, but I'm just going to use it as a reference just to help me understand what happens around this tie around this line of code or this chunk of code, you could say. So ending the game is extremely easy. And again, I have all that code already done. There it is. So in Dark Chamber, like we shaked the ground, we spawned a bomb explosion. <laughs> Did a whole bunch of fun stuff. I made a <laughs> I made a variable called frames after blowing the fuck up. It was really like a frame timer so that it didn't end the game right away. It gave you an opportunity to die. <laughs> Which was kind of a little bit of a troll. <laughs> But yeah, so here's how you do this stuff. You prevent Mario from walking in the end. You set the goal for the level, and if you want to, you can play different music. So I'll copy this code in, but then I'm also going to make some variables. This base2 thing I don't think makes any difference. Set the goal for the level. Yep. So what this is, this is the timer. And I'll show that in a variable. Address, uh, goal, sphere, timer is right here. 
So how the game works is that if you set this address to anything other than zero, it will kick off the little screen that says course complete or course clear, I think. And it will count down that timer until it reaches zero. And then it will end the screen. So when you collect a goal sphere, this address is what controls all of that. So if you just set that to like FF, that's going to trigger all of that. And FF is the, uh, it's 255 in decimal. It's the biggest value for a single byte. So how did they do this in 1990 when developing the original SMW? Uh, yeah, Bold Run, probably it's, it's very similar, I'm guessing. They probably had a big notebook <laughs> full of like addresses and what they do. And then all of the people who are coding in the sprites and everything else were probably just looking at it and trying to understand what did what. <laughs> Yeah, there was probably some sort of shared document somewhere where it had everything. But I guess I I don't know how they did it. <laughs> so preventing Mario from walking in the end. This is just kind of how that's done. Computers we had back then, and it's crazy to think about. Yeah, Bull Run. Yeah. <laughs> it's about 500 notebooks full of... Is that another D's nuts, Thea? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Loco. Fuzzy fans, welcome in. And thank you. I, I hope it's helpful for people. So here's a 13C6. This is just, um, you know, why don't we just go and take a look at it in the memory map just so that we can understand what it is. If we just remove all of these things, we can just put that in up here. Used by SMW's cutscenes. Goes from 01 to 08, and these values are in the order of boss battles. Ah, set to FF in conjunction with a thing to end the level as a boss fight. Mario won't walk during the fanfare, and it will trigger the boss cutscene set in Lunar Magic for the current level, if any. So that's how this works, right? Um, it doesn't necessarily disable uh, walking. It actually sets it to be a boss fight. And that's what triggers an SMW to not walk. <clears throat> I basically just need to bake bosses for my hack. And you're very lost. Well, you came to the right place. <laughs> so um, we've been doing this for four hours now. <laughs> And this is, we built a sprite from scratch. And then we've built onto it all the way up until it's a very, very simple, um, very, very simple boss fight. That you have health and he interacts. <laughs> God damn it, Thea. He interacts, she interacts, sorry, because the boss is actually Thea. Uh, when you jump on it. When you jump on it, her, I guess. <laughs> all right, Thea, let's take a look here. Ugh. Binary to ASCII. Of course. What do we got? Luigi is better? Oh, Thea. <laughs> you want to derail me? Okay, that's cool. That's cool. It's all good. I mean, this whole thing's going on YouTube. Assuming I can fit four hours into YouTube, I don't even know, to be honest. <laughs> Okay, so that's how this thing works. And so this is like, uh, we're going to copy it. We're going to make a variable. Address. Uh, a boss. <laughs> boss. Uh, trigger. Goal. It's, it's kind of a weird thing to mention. But in order to use it is you just deck it, I guess. I'm guessing it's going from like 1 to 0 or something like that. There. Okay. And then we also want to kill the, the Thea, right? <laughs> it is confirmed. Uh-huh. 
Uh-huh. Okay, so we finally need to kill the Thea. It's actually quite simple. There's a number of ways to do that. Um, it's right here. This is this is basically how it's done. If you set, there is a sprite status table, and again, it's just another sprite table. It holds the sprite statuses, and if you set the sprite status to like either zero or two, I think zero just completely removes your sprite altogether almost immediately, like on the next frame, and two it kills the sprite like it it still goes through like the death animation of whatever that might be and then removes the sprite <laughs> i did not consent to being killed you're gonna have to deal with it thea you are the boss <laughs> so we'll go ahead and grab this like 14 something c is it 14 8 c if i remember right 14 c8 oh i was so close 14 c8 so yeah, the sprite status table is something that you use in just about everything. So we'll go ahead and bring it up here. Sprite table status. <laughs> You're gonna have to die, Thea. You're gonna have to die. <laughs> Kill the Thea. Gasp. LDAO2, store it into the sprite status, indexed by X. But wait! But wait. <laughs> I need to say goodbye to my <laughs> Not even saying goodbye to Flex. What? <laughs> okay, alright, alright, alright. Shall we give this a try? Let's give this a try. All right, all right, all right. Open this up, open this up. So basically what we think is gonna happen is we're gonna jump on Thea three times. She's gonna go brying, 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 and then die on the third. <laughs> brying. Brying. Hey! One could say that's a boss fight, right? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of nice, right? <laughs> GG! <laughs> and we made it to the Yellow Switch Palace. Alright. <laughs> Goodbye, friends! <laughs> so let's think. I mean... It's a silly little sprite, and this is something that somebody said to me when I was first starting out on, on boss fights, and it's very true. Um, boss fights are just more complex sprites. That's all they are. And actually not necessarily more complex, depending on the sprite. Like, for example, a shell? That's actually insanely complex. If you guys looked at the shell disassembly that... Uh, I want to say it was I'm Amelia put together for all of us. That is a nutso sprite. Incredibly complicated. Um, and this is technically a boss because it has health. You have to jump on it three times. Um, if you were to incorporate like layer two spikes and a bunch of other things moving around on the screen, this sprite would actually be a fine boss as it is. Simply just because you've made the arena that you're fighting it in more difficult. So, I don't know. Is this where... Do we have any questions? Um, this might be where I call it today, because we've been live for over four hours. I do have to do some editing to kind of trim this video down. And then I'll get it up and I'll just... You guys can watch it and spread it around like crazy if you want to. That's fine. Um, yeah. Except it bounces like a bean, so instead of a boss, it's a piece of shit. <laughs> hey, it doesn't bounce like a bean. It just, it just does the broing like a bean. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fry out there telling us how he really feels. <laughs> 
would you need to create different graphics for, say, a dying animation? Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So, Nugasm. What, what you're getting into is the idea of states. And it becomes a bit more complicated. And the answer is yes. Um, what we would do, and I could show you a couple things quickly here. So what you would do is right now we have a graphic tile number here. It's just up here as 80. So then say, for example, if we had another graphic tile right next to him, right, right over here, and it was a frowny face instead of a smiley face, it would be in location 82 instead of 80. You see where my mouse is highlighting over at the very bottom of that little window. It's got 582. 5 is the page, 82 is the number for the tile. So what I could do is I could just say graphic tile um, death, and it would be 82, right? And now, why is this red? Nothing. When I go down to my graphics routine, instead of loading this in all the time, I would load in that other tile if our sprite state was something different. You know what? Let's just do this. Let's just do this. <laughs> I don't think this will be too bad. We're just going to do this. Okay. We're going to keep sprite state because all bosses have state. What does that mean? New sprite table. Let's go find one. Good question, Nugasm. We're just going to do it real fast. Sprite table. So, again, the sprite tables can be used for anything. And we just have to watch to make sure that when we pick one, um, it doesn't auto-decrement. <laughs> okay, let me get caught up. I don't think this will be too bad two hours later. No, this will actually be pretty quick, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> okay, so miscellaneous sprite table. It's used for vertical directions. Maybe don't use that one. Ooh, this one's perfect. In SMW, is used for charging Chuck's HP, Thwomp's face expressions. We'll use this one. So 15 to 8. Sprite table state. So state is going to be like the sprite is active or the sprite is dying or dead. See, the problem with this is that when we jump on the sprite, it's going to die immediately uh, for the third time. So here's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to set the sprite state to sad um, after the first hit. How about that, Nugasm? And then we'll show you how you can use sprite states to change up how the boss looks at different points in code. It might not make all the sense in the world to do it here, but it still is going to change. Okay. So the sprite state is going to be here. And what we're going to do is we're going to say state happy equals zero, zero. State sad equals oh, 01. These are just constants. So just like our health in the init method, what we're going to do is we're going to say LDA state happy we're going to store that into our sprite table state again indexed by x because it's a sprite table okay so now down in our graphics not graphics quite yet uh sprite tile happy and sprite tile set Okay. So now the locations for happy is already set at 80. We're going to go and make one for 82 real fast like. Bring this over. ASM 101. Uh, X graphics, the binary file. Go ahead and set this to this guy. Copy, pasty. 
All right, all right, all right. Let's make this guy sad. Yep. <laughs> Works pretty well, yeah. <laughs> there. Now we got a sad blob. <laughs> So let's go ahead and reload our graphics. There we go. So now we got a happy blob and we got a sad blob. Accurate. <laughs> Accurate. <laughs> okay. So now the location of that tile, again, like as we were hovering over in Lunar Magic, top left is 80. And over here, top left is 82. So those are our uh, tile numbers. And again, usually you're going to have a series of tiles and you have to loop through things. But again, I'm trying to keep things really simple. So we have a happy tile. We have a sad tile. The properties will not change. So we're only going to keep those the way they are. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick a tile based on the state. Okay, so in this graphics routine, we're using the Y register as an OM index. But we're, what we're not currently using the X, we usually do again because we're usually doing loop things. We're not using X, which means that we can do some pretty easy things here, which is nice. LDA state. Nope. Address... Ah, sprite table. Sprite table state. X. Okay, we're going to compare against happy. State happy. And if it's happy, we're just going to say back branch of equal to uh, happy. Dot happy. Dot after tile. Okay, so in this location, we didn't branch, which means that we're going to load in tile uh, sad or what did I name that thing? State sad. Wait, no, it's not state. State happy. We're going to load in a tile. Graphic tile sad. There it is. LDA graphic tile sad. And then we're going to branch to after tile. And that's simply just so that we don't automatically fall down into happy. And then this, our A register is going to get overwritten by LDA graphic tile, graphic tile happy. Okay, so we load in the state. We compare it to happy. If they equal, we'll, we'll jump over to happy here. We'll load in happy and fall down to after tile. If it's sad... We'll compare, we won't branch, we'll load in sad, and then we'll branch down to after tile. And then whatever is in A, we'll just go ahead and store into 302Y. So, I think the last thing to do is to just set our state to sad at some point. Maybe that could be, you know, near death, but for ease, it's just going to be after we get hit. How about that? Bounce Mario, play sound effect. Sad Thea. <laughs> so we're going to LDA state sad. And we're going to store that into our, uh, our sprite table. Index by X. So now we have, we have a state for our um, for our boss and we've got different graphics that are going to change based on that state because of the graphics routine code that we wrote down here which just does an if else statement if that makes sense I hope that makes sense let's see if it works and I just wanted to show real quick in a large boss fight, 
there's this idea of phases and states, and I talked about this earlier. I would love to get more into detail of this stuff, but it's probably not for this stream because this gets wild. Anyway, I want to show down here. There's a graphics routine here as well, but if it gets a little more complicated, I will write a get tile routine and a get prop routine. Oh, actually not. There is no get prop routine. That's okay. We have a get tile routine. So instead of having the if else right here, it's going to be in its own function. And that's because it's going to start getting more complicated as your boss has more and more states. If that makes sense. You don't want any one routine or function to get too long because then your branches actually start breaking. You can only branch and back and BNE and BCC or whatever so long down the code or up the code before things start breaking. So you want to keep things a little bit more modular. That makes sense. And there are ways around that, but they're all kind of ugly, to be honest. Okay, let's just go ahead and run this, um, and we'll look and see if we have a sad face. All right. Happy Thea. Sad Thea. <laughs> Sad Thea has been killed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I mean, I, that's kind of the gist, you know? Like we did a whole bunch of uh, we did a whole bunch of Uber ASM stuff. I, I'll send a link, Loco. Um, you know what? Hell, let me just drop a link right now. I don't have this uh, video up yet. In fact, I don't think I have any videos on there. I think I deleted them all. <laughs> Hold on. Let me see your channel. My channel has nothing. <laughs> Which is fantastic. Yeah, so it's going to be here very soon. Is that really my channel? Hold on. It's weird. Here. Okay. Tell me if this link works. And not just because I was logged in. Thanks, Zach. <laughs> so yeah, that apparently is my channel, and it will be uploaded there as a public video once uh, once I'm done. It works? Okay, cool. Yeah, so it'll be uploaded there probably soon. I, I'm only going to edit a tiny little part of it and just kind of cut out some stuff. And then the whole video is going to be available. Uh, yeah, it's going to be long. So... <laughs> We need a video like this on your chat. Wait for it. Yeah, I knew it. I knew that's exactly what it was. <laughs> so yeah, I'll make this available. Uh, hopefully today. Hopefully today. Um, and then yeah, feel free to send me any questions. If you want some of the code, the conks of code, just ping me. I'll send over whatever I have. Um, and also feel free to share. Feel free to share. Uh, I hope it was super useful. Why don't we find someone to raid? Because